Don't want your Help question. me, please. I need help. Where are you, ma'am? <laughs> 238 Hell Avenue. I think we just know ma'am, ma'am, I don't ma'am. know where my parents are. Ma'am, calm down. What's going on? Some people broke into our house okay, okay. and they showed all his money. Okay, ma'am, 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 okay, ma'am, 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 where are you? 238 what? Avenue. 238 Avenue Road. Yes. Do you spell the name for me, please? Dad? Good morning, good morning, I call it Ma'am, 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 hello. I'm okay, I'm alright. Hello. Hello. Yes. Ma'am, I need to know your address. Avenue Row, can you please spell it for me? Avenue Row, 238 Avenue, 238 Helen Avenue. My dad just went outside screaming. Ma'am, can you spell the street address for me, please? H-E-L-E-N. So I'm broken and I heard shots like pops. I don't know what's happening. I'm tied upstairs. And I, I think my dad went outside and he's screaming. Okay, you're upstairs? You think someone's still in the house? I, I, I heard them leave. I don't know if they're still around. Okay, are you safe? And, can you lock your door? Are you upstairs? I can't. I'm tied. My hands are tied. You're tied? I had my cell phone in my pocket. Someone invaded your home, ma'am? Yes. You and heard gunshots? Time, they had guns, and they were holding me at gunpoint. Please, please. Okay, do you hear your mom anywhere downstairs? Do you think your mom's outside, too? What? Sorry? Do you think your mom is downstairs, too, still? Or is... I don't hear her anymore. Okay, just take a deep breath, okay? Do you know, do you believe, do you know that if they know your parents, anything like that, was on your relation to them? Do they, do they call them there? They just, they just came and tied you up and... They, they came in and they were like, oh, is all your money? Where's your money? Where's your wallet? And they... They were asking you for money? Yeah, could you call my uncle and my aunt, please? Okay. This is your phone. Don't worry, okay? We have lots of help on the way, okay? What's your name? My name is Jennifer. Jennifer? Okay, Jennifer. You're doing a great job, okay? Uh, I think I hear them. You hear them? Okay, just stand up on me till you see them, okay? <laughs> Jennifer? Jennifer? Yeah. You're still on the phone, right? Okay. Do you, do you see anyone there? Yeah, I hear them. Hello? 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 I'm up there. Okay, Jennifer, they're with you, okay? I don't know. I don't know where my mom is. Jennifer? Yes? They're with you, right? I don't see them yet. I hear them. Okay, you want to stay on the phone with me till you see them? Sure. They're there, okay? <laughs> Jennifer, I'm going to hang up, okay? Okay. Okay, take care, okay? On November 8, 2010, just after 9.30pm, 25-year-old Jennifer Pan was in her bedroom. She had her TV on and was chatting on the phone while getting ready for bed. She had spent the afternoon practicing the piano and studying piano history for an upcoming test. She had been playing the piano since she was four years old. Earlier that day, Jennifer's mother, 53-year-old Bicar, went to visit Jennifer's grandfather and run some errands around Markham in Ontario, Canada. Bikar returned home around 3 in the afternoon. Jennifer's father, 57-year-old Han, had gotten home later than usual from work. He worked half an hour away at an automotive manufacturer in Scarborough, Ontario. He was a metal tool and die operator. Han had forgotten to lock a toolbox and remembered when he was already halfway home, so he had to turn back. When he got home just after 4.30pm, he called his brother, Jennifer's uncle, to see if he wanted to join him shopping they went to Home Depot. Bikar cooked dinner and ate with Jennifer before going to her line dancing class, which she attended every Monday. They put Han's dinner aside for when he got home from shopping. Han got home around 6.15pm. He ate his dinner alone and then went to the study, which was upstairs, next to his and Bikar's bedroom. Han logged onto his computer to catch up on the latest Vietnamese news before going to bed. 
He always went to bed early, as he had to get up for work at 5am. About 6.30pm, Jennifer's friend Adrian visited her. They regularly had TV nights together, and Adrian had brought over the latest episodes of Gossip Girl and How I Met Your Mother for them to catch up on. They went down to the basement TV room together. Adrian left about 9pm, and Jennifer went upstairs to her bedroom. Jennifer put the TV on in her room. The Amazing Race was on. About 9.15pm, she heard her mum get home from line dancing. Jennifer went downstairs and spoke briefly to her mum, who was also watching TV. Jennifer then went back up to her room, where she continued watching TV, and called her friend, an old co-worker, Edward Pacificador. Around 20 minutes later, Jennifer could hear movement downstairs, and voices she didn't recognise. Her mother, who nearly always spoke in a mix of Vietnamese and her native Cantonese, yelled out for Han in English, in a tone that Jennifer knew meant now. It startled Jennifer. There were people in the house. She heard footsteps thudding so loudly up the stairs she knew they could not be her parents. They couldn't be her younger brother Felix either. He was living half an hour away at university. Jennifer hung up the phone on Edward and sat frozen in her room. She was too scared to turn the TV down and she was too scared to open the door. She was too scared to move. She heard men shouting outside her room and then her dad yelling. Han had been asleep but was woken up by the commotion to see a man wearing a baseball cap standing over him. But without his glasses on, Han couldn't see properly. Where's the fucking money? The man in the cap screamed. Before Han got a chance to act, he was dragged downstairs to where another man was standing over his wife of 30 years. Bika was cowering and crying in her silky green Winnie the Pooh pyjamas. All the lights were off. There was just the glow of the TV lighting the room. The first words Bika cried to Han were, How did they get in? Han replied, I don't know, I was sleeping. One of the men yelled, shut up, you talk too much. Upstairs, Jennifer got the courage to open her door a little. A man with dreadlocks flopping around his face saw her. He walked towards her, carrying string. He grabbed her hands and tied them behind her back. I have a gun behind your back. Do what I say. If you do what I say, then no one will get hurt. Where is the money? Show me where your money is. Jennifer gave the man $2,000 cash she had saved. He then dragged her to her parents' room. Show me where they keep the money. Jennifer said she didn't know, and so the man trashed the room with the help of one of the other attackers. They found some money in Big Car's bedside table. One of the men dragged Jennifer into the hallway and down the stairs to where her parents were pleading. He made her kneel on the ground near the foot of the stairs, away from both her parents. This is when Jennifer first realised there were three attackers in total, all men, but she couldn't really see the third man. They were all carrying guns. The third attacker was yelling at her mother. Bikar tried to get up off the floor, but the man was yelling at her to get back down. Bikar's poor English left her confused. She didn't know what he was saying. Jennifer yelled out to her mum to sit down. She didn't want her to get hurt. The man kept yelling, Where's the fucking money? Han said, I have $60 in my pants upstairs, but my possessions are worth plenty. One of the men dragged Jennifer back up the stairs towards her parents' room again. He found the cash. Jennifer remembered her mother had more money stashed and told the man where it was in the bedroom. It was around 1,100 US dollars left over from a trip to the United States they had just taken to go to a wedding. Jennifer hoped this would be enough money for them to let her and her family go. But the men had other ideas. They tied Jennifer to the banister at the top of the stairs. One of the men downstairs started to look around the kitchen. He was looking for Bikar's purse. He even looked in the fridge. I need the fucking money! Han received a hard blow to the back of his head and he watched as blood sprayed over the living room sofa as he fell down. Fucking get up! Han and Bikar were forced down the basement stairs. Bikar was hysterically crying, unable to control herself. You can hurt us, but please don't hurt our daughter. Jennifer screamed out from upstairs to let her go with her parents. Han remained silent. He realised this wasn't just a break-in. The basement was set up as a TV room, with a large leather reclining chair and a two-seater sofa. Blankets were scattered around. 
The TV and stereo cabinet was in the corner with pictures, knickknacks, and a vase of fresh flowers. Han and Bikar were forced onto the sofa with one of the gunmen throwing blankets over their heads. Before Han got to look his attackers in the face, he was shot twice in quick succession. The first shot struck his face, fracturing the bone in the inner corner of his right eye, grazing his carotid artery, the main artery which runs down your neck. The second shot hit him in the right shoulder and exited out the back. Big Heart was screaming. More shots rung out. One. Two. Three. The first entered at the base of Bikar's neck, the second through her right shoulder, and the third entered and exited her skull, killing her instantly. Jennifer was cowering at the top of the stairs. She heard the shots ring out. She heard one of the men say, We've got to go now. It's been too long. The string which was tying her to the banister had a gap of about eight inches which allowed her to reach into the waistband of her yoga pants for her phone. She dialed 911. You heard the call at the start of the episode. Han was silent, but he was not dead. Within seconds he regained consciousness and turned to his wife slumped on the floor. There was blood everywhere. He cried her name over and over, but she was gone. Han was in agony, his face dripping with blood. He was unable to see a thing without his glasses. He was moaning and yelling as he crawled up the basement stairs to the main level of the house. Jennifer was calling out to him from upstairs, crying for him, but he ran for the front door, trying to get help. Outside, a neighbour, Peter Chung, was on his way to work. He walked outside of his house just after the attackers fled in a waiting car. He was confronted by a frantic hand as he collapsed on the ground covered in blood. Police sirens got louder as they approached the house. Peter was with Han when they arrived. Constable Mike Stesko and his partner Brian Darrock were two of the first officers on the scene. They approached Han who was covered in blood and saw a trail leading from the house to where he had fallen. Han was moaning and wailing but managed to say his wife was shot and his daughter was still inside. Other officers started to arrive. One of those was Constable Mason Baines. The officers had no idea where the gunmen were, but their first job was to check inside and clear the house. They approached with their guns drawn. They could hear Jennifer's cries for help upstairs. Constables Stesko and Baines went down to the basement. They were followed by Darrock, who momentarily went downstairs as backup, before going upstairs to Jennifer. It's Darrock you can hear approach her in the 911 call. In the basement, they saw the body of Big Heart on the floor. There was a large pool of blood around her. They attempted to get a response from her, but they got nothing. The paramedics arrived and took over. Darrock climbed the stairs to where Jennifer was huddled at the top, her hands only loosely tied now with the shoelace. She was sobbing as she hung up the phone from the 911 operator. Jennifer told Darrock she didn't know where the attackers were. Darrock gripped his weapon. He moved past Jennifer to check the other rooms of the top floor. There was no one there. The men were gone. Darrock walked back to Jennifer, who was sitting on the floor, slightly to one side, her legs underneath her and her hands centred in front of her. Her hands were bound with a long shoelace. Tightly enough that Darrock needed to find some scissors to cut the lace away, but loosely enough Jennifer could move her hands around eight inches away from the banister. There was no bruising or redness on her wrists that he could see. She was unharmed. Darrock helped her downstairs, putting his own jacket over her and walking her towards a paramedic. Jennifer called out for her father as he was being wheeled into an ambulance himself. The paramedics helped Jennifer into the ambulance, accompanied by Constable Darrock. She asked Darrock where her mother was. He told her that her mother had died in the basement. Jennifer put her head down and covered her face with her hands. By now, neighbours were outside wondering what was going on. The neighbour who had found Han was standing in shock, relaying what he had seen to an officer. None of them knew Bikar was dead. Some neighbours were relatives, and others were very close friends. Once Jennifer had calmed down, Constable Darrock asked her what she remembered about the home invasion. She said there were three men, one with dreadlocks, but that's all she could get out. Constable Mike Stesko relayed in his reports what he witnessed at the scene. Although he had seen a trail of blood splatter on the way in, upon entering the house, he said, quote, Everything in the house seemed to be where it should be. 
Obviously, we've done home invasions in the past where their house has been ransacked, but nothing was out of place, nothing taken. But upstairs was a different story. The master bedroom had been ransacked. Dresser drawers had been pulled out and emptied all over the floor. The mattress pulled off and tipped over on its side. But apart from that, no furniture elsewhere in the house had been disturbed. The house at 240 Helen Avenue, Markham, Ontario, was a middle-class suburban home. A two-storey brown brick house with two white garage doors. It had a large front porch with pillars leading up to welcoming double front doors. In a suburb of large homes, it didn't stand out from the rest. Most houses were similar, and most of the residents were Asian families, like the Pants. From the outside, there was no obvious reason for this house to be targeted over any others. The city of Markham, just north of Toronto, is in the region of York. It's about as safe and as quiet as suburbs get in the area. The community was tight-knit. A woman who lived in the Pans Street said, quote, We've been here 10 years. People don't understand. Why this house? There are bigger homes in the area. Maybe they thought they were an easy target. The Pans were a simple, quiet, hard-working family. It didn't make sense. In the year prior to the home invasion at the Pans, 2009, the York region had a total of 14 home invasions, which was half the amount they had in 2008. Markham had experienced six home invasions so far that year, up to November 2010, none of which had ended in murder. Home invasions were nearly always targeted attacks. Drugs were a common motive, but a random home invasion which ended in murder was almost unheard of in Markham. Almost every detective in the region was assigned to the Pan case in some way. Within a day, home security companies descended on the suburb door knocking and selling camera systems. The baffled and frightened community wondered who would be next. Canadian statistics for the year prior to the attack on the Pans showed that of 453 solved homicides, 242, over half, were committed by partners. 87 were committed by a blood relative. 42 were committed by an acquaintance, leaving 82 murders in the year prior committed by someone unknown to the victim, including people caught in crossfire. Han and Bic Ha Pan had both been raised and educated in Vietnam. They arrived to Canada separately in 1979 as political refugees. They met in Toronto and got married not long after. In 1986, their first child, Jennifer, was born, followed three years later by their son, Felix. Han and Bika worked hard in their first jobs at an automotive parts manufacturer in Aurora, a town just over an hour's drive from Toronto. They lived a frugal life in the Toronto district of Scarborough. They didn't like living there. It was a rough neighbourhood, and they were robbed. Han and Bika made it their goal to move their family to a better area. By 2004, they had saved hard and moved to Markham. They bought a large home with a two-car garage on a quiet residential street. Markham had a large Asian community and they were close to relatives and friends. By the late 2000s, Han was driving a Mercedes-Benz and a Big Ha, a Lexus. Big Ha lost her job in 2008 when the company had cutbacks. She found it hard to find employment, but her and Han continued to make it work, especially for the education of their children. By 2010, they had saved $200,000 in the bank and could afford to support their two children through college. Their hard work and dedication was very evident. They were strict parents who seemingly lived for their children. They wanted to give their children all the things they weren't able to have growing up. They seemed happy, but for two years leading up to the home invasion, they slept most nights in separate rooms. According to Jennifer, they hadn't been getting along very well at all. There had always been tension, but lately it had gotten worse. Lots of arguments and yelling would occur most days, Jennifer sometimes had to mediate and be the common ground between them. Jennifer felt that if she could be good for them, they would be happy. Han and Big Ha pushed their kids academically, wanting the best for them. In the early days, before moving to Markham, Jennifer, then four years old, was playing the piano. By the time she was in elementary school, she had a room full of awards. She figure skated from a young age, but not for fun. She trained hard in the hope she would make it onto the 2010 Canadian Winter Olympic team. Even as a young child, Jennifer would often train until 10pm, then go home and do homework till midnight. 
but Jennifer started to bomb out in skating competitions. She tried to hide her devastation from her parents, not wanting to add worry to their disappointment. Sometimes Big Heart would comfort her, saying, You know, all we want from you is just your best. Just do what you can. At Mary Ward Catholic Secondary College, in Grade 8, Jennifer worked hard. It was expected that she would receive valedictorian that year, the top honour of her grade, as well as receive a bunch of awards for her academic achievements. But she didn't win valedictorian. She won no awards. She put on what she would later describe as her happy mask. In spite of this, and in the proud eyes of her parents, Jennifer went on to do well. The expectation was that both the Pan children would go to Toronto University. Han and Bikar also had very set ideas about Jennifer's extracurricular activities. She was allowed to figure skate as long as she worked towards her goal of nationals or the Olympic team. She could pursue music, but she had to work hard on music theory and pass exams. She was not allowed to go to parties, dances, and most importantly, she was not allowed to have a boyfriend. Her focus in life were her studies and her goals. She never had sleepovers, and she never went on trips away with anyone. She was, however, allowed to go on a two-week band trip to Europe towards the end of high school in 2003. This is where Jennifer and her friend Daniel Wong became more than just friends. That summer, they started seeing each other, but Jennifer didn't dare tell her parents. Jennifer had met Daniel in grade 11 at band practice. Daniel was also the son of Asian immigrants. He had a Filipino and Chinese background. During the last year of high school, Daniel's parents moved him to the Cardinal Carter Academy, an art school in North York. He was falling behind in his studies at Mary Ward, and he was starting to get himself into trouble, dealing drugs. By the end of school, he had been charged with trafficking cannabis after half a pound was found in his car. Jennifer didn't like the drug dealing. She wasn't interested in drugs and didn't really want him to deal. Daniel refused to stop, but he kept her out of it and Jennifer was smitten with Daniel, so nothing was going to stop her seeing him. Not his drug dealing, and not her parents. When her parents eventually found out she had a boyfriend, they immediately put an end to it. But Jennifer didn't end it. She kept her relationship with Daniel a secret, and snuck around behind her parents' back to keep seeing him. Jennifer's grades were high enough to get her accepted into Ryerson University on early admission. Even though this wasn't Toronto University, Han and Bikar were thrilled when they learned Jennifer had received a scholarship to Ryerson, and they supported her decision to do two years there studying science. Her plan was to then transfer to Toronto University to study pharmacology. They supported her financially, depositing money into her bank account, and they often drove her to university. They even allowed her to spend a couple of nights a week at a fellow classmate's house, so she wasn't so exhausted. There was a time during university where Jennifer's parents found out she was seeing Daniel again. They were furious and made her stop seeing him. Jennifer understood. She knew they just had her best interest at heart, and so she told them she had cut off communication with him and continued on with her studies. When she got a work placement at the hospital for sick kids in Toronto, Jennifer's parents thought their dream for their daughter had been realised. After the home invasion, Jennifer was taken to hospital where she was seen by doctors and crisis workers. She was told her father was undergoing life-saving surgery and was in a critical condition. She was given medication to calm her down as she was badly shaken and suffering shock, but physically she was unharmed. At 1.31am, when doctors felt she was stable enough to be released, she was taken by Constable Darrock to Markham Police Station so she could make a statement. Once there, police seized her phone in case it could help them with any information as to why her family was targeted. A major case management unit was quickly put together. Three experienced investigators formed what is known as a command triangle. Having three head investigators gives the team the ability to have three sets of eyes on all aspects of the investigation, and was the best strategy for managing the large team of officers who were working on the case. Detective Sergeant Larry Wilson, the most experienced of the three, was named the Senior Investigating Officer, responsible for the direction of the investigation. Detective Bill Curtis was put in charge of running the day-to-day -day tactical strategy. He had previously led five homicide investigations, and had been involved in a total of 80 others, including one of Markham's most infamous, involving convicted murderer Chris Little. Curtis was harsh, but had an excellent track record. 
Detective Constable Alan Cook, a former drugs and vice detective who also worked in the intelligence unit, was placed as the file coordinator. Cook was known for his undercover expertise. Veteran York Regional Police Detective Randy Slade was on duty. He had already met Jennifer at the hospital. Jennifer was shaken and in shock, but Slade explained that giving her statement now was going to be their best chance of finding the people responsible. By the time he sat down in the interview room with Jennifer, it was 2.45am. She had just lost her mum and her dad was in hospital fighting for his life. Jennifer was 25, but could easily pass for 16. Detective Slade explained the forms he needed her to sign, the standard procedure for giving a voluntary statement. He was very careful to put Jennifer at ease, and he explained she didn't have to give a statement if she didn't want to, or wasn't ready. Do you understand the criminal consequences of making a false statement? Yes. Do you understand that it is your choice whether or not to give a statement? Yes. Do you understand the importance of telling the truth? Yes, I do. With respect to this investigation? If you have spoken to any per police officer or person in authority in connection with the investigation, I want it clearly understood, but I do not want it to influence you in making, under uh, uh, making a statement. Do you understand? Yes. Yeah. Do you have any questions? So basically, um, just start anew right now. So what, what I've just explained to you is you're here voluntarily to help us that you don't have to talk to us if you don't want to, but the importance of talking to us, and if you're talking to us, the importance of telling the truth. And if you don't tell the truth, there's criminal consequences for not telling the truth. That's all that all that stuff had to deal with, okay? You can't point the finger at someone else. You can't tell us to go off in a different direction. You just gotta tell us the truth. What I know. Exactly, exactly. And do you have any questions with respect to what I've just told you? It's just like sitting sometimes like Parts come back, but I didn't remember when I spoke No one to is, it. and that's the process. This is going to be a long process. This is an initial statement from you. We may, you know, as you remember other things, you may be asked, you may want to come in and tell us things, okay? No one is going to tell you how to give us a, give a perfect statement. You just do it the best you can, given, the, given what you're dealing with, okay? Any other questions? At the beginning of the interview, Jennifer started to realise the enormity of what had just happened to her and her family. She sat nervously in the chair, pulling the sleeves of her sweater over her wrists, and went between rubbing her thighs to covering her face with her hands, crying. At the first mention of her mother's death, Jennifer put her head down and started to cry. Slade told Jennifer he would get her some tissues before saying, You have nothing to apologise for, Jennifer. It's going to be tough, but you know the importance of this statement. You have nothing to apologise to me for. I am here to help you, okay? Slade left the room to grab the tissues. Jennifer sat with her head down and her hands over her face. She appeared to be crying. When Slade opened the door to walk back in, Jennifer jumped about a half a foot in the air. Detective Slade asked Jennifer to tell him as much about the day as she could. Then they moved on to what happened during the home invasion. Jennifer told him the story start to finish. Next, Slade asked her to tell him again, but in a different way. He asked Jennifer to recall the invasion, but this time as if she was looking down on the event. This is a technique which helps witnesses recall parts of what they saw that they may not necessarily have recalled before. It can also show investigators if there is any change or inconsistency in the witness's story. Jennifer described the men as best she could. One was of African-American appearance with dreadlocks that were shorter at the front and longer at the back. He was of medium build and between 28 and 32 years of age. He wore black leather gloves. The second man she described as taller, with a smaller frame, wearing a dark coloured bandana which covered the bottom half of his face, and a hooded sweater. The third man didn't engage with Jennifer at all. She couldn't describe his appearance, but she recognised that maybe he had a Jamaican accent. This new technique enabled Jennifer to remember details about the home invasion that she was unable to recall before. She remembers that the man with the dreadlocks yelled out to the thinner man to tell Cuzzy, who was the third man, to get some more string. That was how she was tied to the banister upstairs. She also described seeing the cylinder of a gun and remembered more details about the third man. 
While retelling the story about the gunshots she heard while tied to the banister, Jennifer recalled the man with the dreadlocks saying, that's enough, after a few gunshots. After hearing the words, that's enough, Jennifer heard one more shot. This would be the shot that killed her mother. About one hour into the interview, Jennifer remembered more detail. She was able to clearly differentiate the three voices of the attackers and could tell which of the three men were saying what. She could hear the words the men were saying to her parents in the basement. She clearly heard the third attacker say, You just had to do what we said. You just had to cooperate. Um, do you know which way they go out? You can't I'm, hear that. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was the front door, yeah. but I'm not 100%. I didn't get to see anything. Like, my arms were behind my back, and I was against the banister. Yep. And the banister is twisted, so I can't see the front door. Now you hear your dad. Yep. Right? And what's going on? So what do you hear next after you hear the scrambling? They're gone. Because you're hearing no more. I gather that's how you assume they're gone is because you don't hear them. Then you hear your dad. I, I reach for my phone. At okay. That point. And you call 911. Okay. And then you, what happens after you're on? Uh, I just, I, I heard my dad go out. And I don't know if they damaged his throat. Or how did you hear your dad? So what? I, this is the kind of importance because if you, he did he go out the front door? How did you, door. how did you know he went out the front door? Because I heard him open the door. Did you hear that door open when these guys were scrambling to leave? There was just so much thudding. And Is your house got an alarm system? Yes. Do you know the alarm system when the front door goes off and there's that chirping? We, don't, we don't have that chirping. No? No. Is your house alarmed at night when you guys go to bed? Before the last person goes up to bed, they will alarm it. But prior to that, it doesn't get alarmed? Okay. So... You hear your, you, from your, when your father exits, you hear the door open because you hear your dog and then you And then I can hear like the outside noises. Okay. It's like the wind coming in and I just hear my dad, ah, I think he's... You think that he's sustained some kind of injury because he's not, you can't understand what he's saying. Okay. What about, do, do you, can you hear your mom? Okay. Where does your dad go? Do you know where? You never see your dad again until when we're at the hospital. I think that's what you said, right? I saw him when he was on the gurney, but the officers walked me around. So I really didn't. Okay, so now you're upstairs and you're on the phone with the 911 operator. Okay. Do you remain on the phone until the police arrived? And the officer is the one who cuts, gets you free? He, he first had to secure the place. Yes. It took me a while to get somebody upstairs. Okay. And... He kept screaming. Okay. And, um... I guess they went into my bedroom and I have a pair of scissors that I cut my hair with. Yes. And they said that they cut it for me, but... It was still a while longer until after they cut the string so I could be free. Do you understand that they... Uh, no. of the importance to clear the, the, what they were doing. It wasn't to leave you in any kind of trauma or anything like that. I understand. It was just... Did... From, it's a very tough question considering all the things that you've gone through tonight, Jennifer, is any of the tying up, any of the binding, any of the things, were you sexually assaulted in any way? It wasn't that. This was strictly they were after money. It, from what I saw, they were after money. They wanted it now. How much money did you turn over to them? From my personal, I had two twenty-five hundred. Twenty-five hundred, and where Roughly. was that? And where was that? In my nightstand underneath the TV. Okay, and that was from work that you had done. Yeah. What do you do for a living now? What are you doing right now? I heard you were saying about piano. Are you in school? I I recently lost all my students in piano. I had a few yes. for a while. But uh, they've gone on to university. That's why as of September, I didn't have any more students. So you were a piano instructor? Yes, out of my home. Okay. Just for family friends here and there. Um, also, my family needed me home for a while. And I was doing some uh, piano classes with a very good teacher of mine. Okay. And I'm going back to school in January. To? 
to study biotechnology engineering. Okay. Detective Slade was able to ascertain a lot about the evening from Jennifer and said he was happy with the information he had. But he thought he needed to find out a little more about where her mother was that evening, the exact location of the line dancing class, and if she went elsewhere after line dancing. Before Slade left the interview room, he asked Jennifer if she consented to her phone records being examined so they could check timestamps for when she was speaking to Edward on the phone to match the exact time of the home invasion. Jennifer agreed. Slade then advised Jennifer not to read the papers or watch TV. He didn't want her seeing or reading things that would cause her distress. It was about one and a half hours into the interview when Detective Slade left the room to get the phone record consent forms. Jennifer sat with her face in her hands. She remained still, not crying. She sat like that for over ten minutes before she reached for a tissue. Jennifer then stood up, stretched her legs and paced a little while holding the chair in the wall. She was agitated. A noise outside made her jump. Then she started to motion with her hands as if she was conducting music. She sat back down and again covered her face with her hands. She wiped her eyes. She got back up and rocked back and forth on her feet, rubbing her stomach. Slade startled her when he opened the door and told her to have a seat. Slade mentioned that her brother Felix was being interviewed next door. Jennifer seemed surprised. Slade made it clear that he felt Bicar may have been followed home after line dancing, spotted by her attackers driving an expensive car. When Detective Slade was filling out the phone record consent form, he told Jennifer he was going to go back and check a nine-day period. My question is, how far deep into this will I look for my phone? Just like comment, like regular phone calls to people, just stuff like that? Really, it's just the time stamping of, of the, you know, we, we're putting nine days down because it may come back to you that, um, oh, I spoke to him, and it may be able for us to be able to identify people that we may need to go back and interview. The, the interest of us is obviously tonight between 9 and 10, right? Um, but we're just asking for this. We're not asking for months and months and months. It's nine days that we're asking for. And generally, it's because we may come back to you and say, okay, we want to interview um, this person. And you go, oh, I don't know where they live, but I spoke to them. Or we've got the phone records, is this the same person? And we'll have their address, at least what is registered to their phone. Mm-hmm. So it's the only reason we're asking for a nine-day period. Mm-hmm. No, investigatively, it's, it's, it's not of no real significant value other than today, mm-hmm. right? It's only because sometimes I phone, you know, like teachers and stuff like no, that. No, we're not going to go back and interview all those people. That's not our intention, right? Um, so I need you to fill out this portion for me so owner subscriber it's the same person as this so it's you and you your address the telephone number and um and today's date and then your signature and what it is is before we go into it it's all this is all being recorded again so it's just that you consent to giving us the records for cell phone number 647-965-2118 um, and you consent to allow the York Regional Police to access the phone records, the said cellular phone company authorized Rogers. For the following, billing records, incoming and outcoming numbers dialed, registered owner information including credit and payment history. This is really how we link phones to people, how we confirm that it's your phone, and the tower site location if requested for the above mentioned times and dates. And towers now become, uh, I just dropped that, towers become relevant in this case because of where you are when the phone call comes in on the, on today's date, right? Is that it firms your story to saying that I was in my room when I made that, when the calls came in. And um, that will show up on the tower site information. That's the relevance of the tower site information. It also may turn out that maybe during this time period, you were targeted and you were in an area and this it enables us to go back and try and look for cameras and other things through the towers. I'm not saying it's going to happen in your case, but it's why we ask for tower sites, right? Tower sites always show when you're on the phone, they show you where you're where you are when you're on the phone making calls. Um, 
and that the above mentioned records are to be released for the York Reg- to the York Regional Police for the purposes of an investigation of murder of your mum, and for the time period as stated, November 1st to November 9th. This is the part of the consent. I am voluntarily giving consent, and I know that I, you don't have to. You don't have to do this. This is your. You, this is you volunteering to do this. You may withdraw your consent at any time. I understand that these records may be used as evidence against, against me and may become any part of a criminal proceeding. Now, if you were lying on this, you know, as a part of this whole process that I explained, telling us fictitious information, it comes back. Now the records can also be used against you. If you're telling the truth, really, point three it means nothing, okay? Um, but we have to let you know by law that we could use these against you if you're lying to us. So will you... Will we be in, will I be informed of who of my if anybody if they contacted on that? Um, the chances are if you're going to be so you, you can almost guarantee that Adrian and Edward are going to be we're going to need to speak to them, right? Because Adrian was in your house. Remember, um, if they're doing forensic testing in your house to try and get DNA and anything else in there, they're also going to need stuff to eliminate people, okay. right? So Adrian was in your house. Yes, um, so we need to try and uh, if you when when we shut this down, I'm going to because it doesn't need to be disclosed on video about their personal information. I need to get Adrian's contact information. I need to get Edward's contact information. I don't know if we're going to contact them t- tonight or this morning, but sometime today they're going to be spoken to. Okay. Um, our priority is who is with your mum. That's our priority right now. Okay. Um, but I, I, I just tweak me back. How many cars do your, do your does your family own? The Mercedes and the Lexus. And where do your parents park these cars? My dad always parks it on the right, and my mom always parks it on the left. Inside the garage. And when they, where do they enter the house when they when they park in the garage? Is there an entrance through the garage? Okay, so that's the normal course as they park. Unless we we plan on going out somewhere, we leave the car in the driveway instead of having to. When you left today, left tonight after this incident had happened, did you see the cars in the garage? I did not, but I believe that one of the officers went and checked and said that the cars were still in the garage. The garage doors were closed? Yes. Okay. Um, is there any video equipment, video cameras, or any video system on you in your house? To record? No. No? Okay. Is there anything else that you can think of that might help us right now in this investigation? Not off the top of my head. The interview finished at 4.30am. The day following the home invasion, Tuesday, November 9th, Jennifer had to stay with her cousin, Michelle Luong, and her aunt and uncle, whose home was less than a mile away from her own. Her house was a crime scene, and there was no way she could go in and get any of her belongings. She was forced to borrow clothes from her cousin. Her phone received text after text from friends asking if she was okay. Her ex-boyfriend, Daniel Wong, heard the news. He sent a text at 9am. If you need, I'm here for you. Just hang in there and try to eat. Although told by Detective Slade not to look at any media reports, it was hard not to hear about the reports and subsequent rumours starting to unfold. Were the Pan family caught up in illegal gambling? Were there links to gangs or drug crime? The waiting media were camped outside the relatives' homes as well as the hospital, waiting for a glimpse or possible statement from the only survivor able to speak. Jennifer faced lots of questions from both friends and family. The family held a vigil at Han's bedside as he laid in an induced coma in the intensive care unit. They listened as the doctor explained how miraculous it was that Han was able to survive the shooting. He still had bullet fragments in his face, but the fact that the bullet missed the main artery was what ultimately saved him. But he wasn't out of the woods. They were still unsure if or when Han would come out of the coma, but there was hope he would pull through. Amidst the horror they were confronted with, the family were very hopeful. Han may have the clue to solve this horrific crime. Jennifer asked the doctor if the bullet fragments still in her father's neck could cause an infection. The doctor said no. At this point, Jennifer borrowed some change from her uncle, explaining that her cell phone had died and she needed to use the payphone. He offered for her to use his cell phone, but she refused and again asked for two quarters. 
He handed them to her and she walked out and headed for the payphones located just up the hall. Jennifer called her ex-boyfriend, Daniel Wong. The day after the invasion, police held a press conference. The media scrambled to the Newmarket Police Headquarters to obtain a glimpse into what the police were thinking. A makeshift stage was erected and York Regional Police Chief Armand Labarge, who was less than a month away from retirement, addressed the waiting press. He said, quote, Given the very brutal nature of this crime, it goes without saying that the individuals that are responsible for the home invasion and the murder last night pose a very real danger to our community. These are, for all intents and purposes, residents that were just enjoying a nice night when suddenly three individuals burst into their home and terrorised them. In other home invasions, there's some criminal activity involved. But in this particular situation, there is absolutely no evidence of criminal activity. This is a very lucky man. And if not for the grace of God, we could have been dealing with two homicides here. To shoot an innocent woman and to shoot an innocent man. I mean, that's troubling. Police stated that they believed the murderers may have been attracted to the home because of the family's high-end vehicles. However, they also noted that neither vehicle was taken as part of the robbery. They released descriptions of the attackers provided by Jennifer. With her father still in a coma, that's all the information they had to go on. Police had already made some progress, seeing as a neighbour had a security camera installed at the front of his house. The footage captured a car driving away from the Pan's house. Behind the scenes, police and forensic teams were combing the house, retracing steps and attempting to get into the heads of the three attackers. They couldn't find a clear reason why a hard-working family was targeted in what they could only describe as a random, brutal attack. Two detectives canvassed almost 400 homes in the neighbourhood. Their job was to establish anything seen or heard, but also to find out information about the pans that may help them solve the crime. While sitting in their vehicle during the canvas, someone quietly approached them and told them that Daniel Wong, Jennifer's ex-boyfriend, was a drug dealer. Considering there was a chance that the invasion was a targeted attack, and many home invasions have a drug connection, this was an important tip. After a quick system check confirmed that Daniel had prior drug convictions, they got to work looking into him. It was no secret amongst officers that the case had divided them. Half of them felt something just didn't sit right about the home invasion. The other half saw it as a random, brutal attack for money on a very unlucky family. Information that police were privy to but had not been released to the media was the fact that in the house they had found $240 in Big Har's purse, $60 in Han's wallet, and $20 in Jennifer's wallet. For intruders hell-bent on finding wallets and money, they had left some behind. On Thursday, November 11th, at 9.30am, Jennifer went back to the police station for another statement. The investigators hoped she may remember more about the home invasion. Her father, Han, was still in a coma. In the interview room, she told Detective Slade she was a little nervous. She was wringing her hands constantly. He replied, don't worry, the truth is always the best way to relieve anxiety. He told her she might need to be a witness in court, and Jennifer got visibly upset. Okay, so what we're going to do now is, as I said, what what education level do you have? Just the high school. High school? Have you gone to any other curriculum, like after school, a higher level of education? Have you been working towards anything? Uh, I'm going back to school and I have been working on the piano education. Okay, there's no other education that you've sought, like you haven't gone to university at this point in time? Okay, so... Um, I want, I want you to f- forget or put aside the first statement that we had talked about, okay? This is going to be where I'm going to ask you to start from the day, okay, on the 8th, leading up until when, you, when the police become involved in an incident that takes place in your house. I want you to tell me about your day, what you do, your interaction with your parents, Okay, so we're at what we are is we're dealing with the incident. We're not dealing with your history right now. We're dealing with the incident again to see if anything else comes. Forgetting what you've already told me and bring yourself through that day and through the event. And we'll see if what we're going to see if we've learned or if you've remembered anything else. And there's some questions with respect to that uh, statement 
that I'm going to ask you about. Okay, so, but I'm going to let you start again, and and let's let's move forward from any time in that day where you want to start. If it's the time you woke up, or if it's the time that your first interaction, it's your choice. Okay, I'm just I'm very nervous, and I why are don't you let's anyone. why are you why are you nervous? Tell me about why you're nervous. Because I don't want to say the wrong thing. Oh, yeah, so because that you, day was a lot. You're right, and I've been scattered and so bits and pieces are here and some pieces aren't here and I'm just so I want you to sit back in your chair okay just sit back in your chair take a deep breath okay close your eyes just follow my line just sit back in the chair for a second sit back relax is the best you can close your eyes and just breathe for a minute okay We're not in any type of danger. We're nowhere. We're in a very safe place. Okay? And we're going to work through this. And don't worry about what you forget or what you mix up or whatever you're doing. Is You start and pl push the play button for that day. And if you stick to everything that you remember happening that day, it will come out in sequence. Okay, and I'm going to show you a technique after we go through this that will, sh that will show it to you. Okay, so let's just start. You've taken a deep breath. You've relaxed. You're in a good position right there. Let's start from the beginning of the day when you wake up and let's start moving forward from there. Jennifer described the day again. She was wringing her hands constantly. Her face was completely void of emotion. She again described her mum going to visit her grandfather. So she left to go pick up my aunt and go in to my grandfather's and I went back up to on the computer to do a little studying, taking a break and playing some games. Um, do you remember speaking to anyone during the day on your on your phone or on the on Facebook? Um Later on in the day, yes, I spoke to a longtime friend, Andrew, who I went to elementary school with. Um, but just the usual, he he just asked if we could uh, hang out anytime soon. But I explained to him that I wasn't able to leave the house and I couldn't meet up with him. So I asked him how his life was, how his girlfriend, how his job was going. Um, I believe that was later on in the day, though. That wasn't in the afternoon. We'll go in later in the in when we, when we talk about your past about why you couldn't leave the house. Okay, so that isn't that hasn't gone unnoticed, but we're not going to talk about that right now. We're talking about that day. Okay. So continue on. Detectives already knew what Jennifer was referring to. They already knew Jennifer's parents had ordered her not to leave the house because she had lied to them about what she had been doing, what she had been doing for the past decade. The interview continued. Jennifer talked through the evening again, dinner with her mum, her friend Adrian coming over to watch TV. This time, Jennifer mentioned that when she went upstairs to her bedroom to watch TV, she talked to her friend Andrew again, the old school friend she had talked to earlier in the day. This is the third time she had recounted the story of the evening, but the first time she mentioned this call to Andrew. She then described the call to Edward. Edward was the friend she hung up on when the home invasion started. I go back up my stairs and I call Ed again. Okay. And uh, I had to use the washroom, so I did put him on mute for a quick second. And then I came back and I was just watching TV and talking with Ed. Okay. How long are you now upstairs on the phone with with Edward? I'm sorry, but that time frame, just like, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, your cell phone records are going to give us the exact times. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Are, have you talked to anyone else? Is is it you hang up with Edward, go down and see your mom, mm -hmm. come back upstairs, yes. call Edward, yes. use the washroom, mm -hmm. on the phone with Edward still? Yes. Have you talked to anyone else? No. Okay. Have you text message anyone else? No. How many? I don't believe I had to. Do you have more than one phone? 
I had one, but I keep that. I just keep the SIM card. Yeah. Um, again, we will go into the, in the history. Sure. But uh, my cell phone gets taken away from me sometimes. Okay. And so I had um, a friend of mine, Daniel. He bought. He got a SIM card for me to use sometimes. But I take the SIM card out when I finish it, and I normally keep it in my pocket so my parents wouldn't find it. Yes. But I don't remember the last time I. I used it. Okay, but you didn't use that SIM card that day? No, I did not know. You did not? I don't remember the last time. Maybe it was a few days before that. It was the last time I remember using it was when my grandfather was in the hospital. And I had messaged him and he asked me how my grandfather was. And how long, when is that time frame that your grandfather went into the hospital? He was in the hospital for about 10 days. 10 days, okay. So that's the last time you remember using that SIM card associated yes. to, uh, from what your friend had given you yes. was about 10 days earlier or even 12 days earlier because I believe you said your grandfather had come out of the hospital or was he still in the hospital? No, he was in the hospital for 10 days. Yes. On Saturday, he had gone back to his nursing home and this is Monday we're talking So about. it's about 12 to 14 days earlier that this happened that you use you use the sim card you're guessing with the probably more within a week yeah within a week yeah because i would message Give or take him seven while, days is that what you were saying yeah because uh i would message him when my grandfather was in the hospital okay yeah and where is that sim card now i'm not sure i don't remember i had it in my jacket pocket but i don't remember where it is now okay Jennifer's story of the home invasion changed from her first interview. Detective Slade was aware of the change in her story and continued to ask for clarity as Jennifer recalled different places the three men were and the different things they said. Jennifer started to sob. Slade handed her a tissue. He pushed her to keep going with her memories. He wanted her to feel at ease. He was on her side. He was listening. It's not uncommon for witnesses to remember more details or have changes in their story especially in highly stressful and traumatic situations such as Jennifer faced. In an adjacent room, other detectives were watching the interview as it happened via video link. Detective Al Cook watched carefully as Jennifer sobbed and wiped her face. He couldn't see any tears. Jennifer sobbed as she recounted hearing the pops of the gun down in the basement. Pop. 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 She said she thought the men went out the front door. Her father then came up the basement steps, moaning as she called 911. She called out to her dad, but he didn't go to her. He ran out the front door, out into the street where he collapsed on the ground and was seen by the neighbour going to work. Detective Al Cook was still watching in an adjoining room. He noticed how Jennifer was describing the way her father ran from the house screaming. Cook found it interesting that Han's daughter was yelling for him. He knew she was upstairs, but instead of running upstairs to see if she was okay, he ran straight out the front door. Detective Slade listened as Jennifer struggled to retell the story. When she was done, he made her tell it backwards. He continued to tell her what a great job she was doing and not to worry when she thought she said something wrong. Jennifer was then asked to recount exactly how she made the 911 call. Slade got her to stand up and act it out. Slade. It's obviously very relevant. We know you made the phone call, but questions are obviously going to be raised that if my hands are bound and I'm against the railing, how do I talk to a 911 operator? Jennifer screwed her eyes up as she looked at Detective Slade. Slade, and how did you manage to tuck your phone into the waistband without it slipping down or without the intruders noticing it? Jennifer took a large sip of water, a deep breath, and removed her sweater. She slipped the fake phone given to her by Slade into her waistband. While keeping her wrists together in a display of being bound, Jennifer twisted herself trying to reenact the call. She pressed the buttons and then attempted to lift the phone up towards her ear while still keeping her wrists together. The phone didn't reach. She said to Slade, I'm yelling at the phone like this. The phone was about a foot and a half from her ear. The detectives had heard bits and pieces about Jennifer's past. They had spoken to family members and friends and knew some of the answers to questions Slade was asking, but they needed to hear it from Jennifer. What I want to do now is I want to go into your past, okay? 
and start talking about things that have been going on with you in in, in relation to your life, okay? You know, not I'm not going back to childhood. That's not my interest. Is uh, obviously in the last few years is what's going on. Do you have a boyfriend? I had a boyfriend, but no, I don't have. One. What, what's your what's your, what was your boyfriend's name? Daniel. Daniel what? Wong. Tell me about your relationship with you and Daniel. It was a really tough one. Um, we went to high school together. He helped me through a really difficult time in high school um, when I have asthma, but it it wasn't a concern. Uh, it was only a concern when I was younger. Um, but when I went over to Europe, um, a lot of sick people were smoking cigarettes and it acted up over there and he took care of me over there. When did you go to Europe? 2003. Okay, and how long were you there for? Under two weeks, I think. Okay. So this is 2003 when you and Danny were started dating? No, uh, later on in 2003. We were just friends at that point. Okay. What grade were you in at that point? 11. So how does your relationship with Danny uh, develop? Where, where does it go and how long does it last? It lasted about six years. Um, it began in the summer of 2003 before my grade 12 year. Uh, we were just really good friends and I guess it just happened. Like we just started going out. Well, saying that we were going out, but um, I didn't really get to see him much. Let's talk about that. Why didn't you get the chance to see him much? I wasn't allowed to have a boyfriend. And that was when you were 18? I was 17. 17 turning in your 18th year? Maybe grade I 11 or going into grade 12? No, going into grade 12. Okay. And uh, so who was against you having a boyfriend? My father. Your father? How was your mother in this? She took a back seat to his opinion. Um, she would tell me that I gotta find someone who was devoted to me. But at that time, she just, my father was the one that enforced the rules. And what were the issues your father had with a boyfriend? Was it Danny in particular or, Dan or was it just no, a boy? Just any boy at okay. that point. So what happens how, how are you saying that you're not allowed to see this what what uh, i know i know that there's certain ways that you can still get around your father not allowing you to see it when in grade 12 uh, we went to school together he transferred out um but he'd come over uh to our original high school and he'd come see me okay and once in a while i'd go and skip class and go see him so you were seeing, you were dating him essentially without your parents' knowledge and consent? Yes. What would they have done to you if they found out? And did they find out? Not in high school. Okay. So you finish high school and then what do you do when you finish high school? I was, I wanted to do kinesiology, but my my father was very adamant on doing something in the medical field that was a little bit more, um, in his opinion, more, like a more successful, I guess you can say. Um, he knew I didn't have the stomach for being a doctor. Um, so he wanted me to become a pharmacist. Okay. Did you go to school for pharmacy? Did you get any university for pharmacy? So if you are you finish your grade 12, you go to OI, your OIC year? Like grade 12 is you finish your OIC year. I don't have OIC. I didn't have OIC. I finished my grade 12. And then where where do you, what do you do for the next few years? While your dads want you to get into the medical field, what do you do? I was trying to get into piano. What school? I I was still taking classes at a conservative, like a, a school, but it's still recognized in the community as a teacher's license. Through the Royal Conservatory? Yes. Okay, so how is this interaction, how is this going with your dad? How is the, how is your home life with the, you're not 
Now not living up to her, his expectations, he you... He didn't know I lied to him. What did you lie to him? What did you tell him? That I was going to school. For? Uh, for just pre-med, uh, not pre-med, sorry, science. For science. Bachelor of Science. You would have had bills for school. How is how is that coming up? How are these bills being paid for for university that you weren't going to? I was working at Eastside Mario's and I took care of myself. So like he, financially, my father was never, he never took hand in bills. So he didn't know anything about bills. Did your mom know that you weren't going to university? No. So both your parents thought you had gone to university? Yes. Okay. And um, how long did that, how long, did they still to this point in time think that you had gone to university for, for pharmacy, for sciences? Yes. And how did you feel about that? How did you feel about having to lie to your parents? I felt guilty, but every time I tried to bring it up, there was just so much, so much expectation. Did you have any resentment towards him for this? I chose what I chose, um, but in the end, I chose my family. Okay, so now you're not allowed to see boys. How do you continue really your relationship while you're supposed to be at university working at Eastside Marios? Are you working during the day at Eastside Marios? Um, sometimes, but not all the time. So how do how do you maintain this relationship with uh, with Daniel? Um, I bus down to see him or my parents would drive me down to Toronto and they thought I was getting going to school but I'd go see him and I'd come back. What school did they think you're going to? Ryerson. Okay. Um, was Daniel aware of what was going on in your with the issues in your life with your parents? Not at first but eventually he found out. Okay. And um, what would your parents do f find out? Did they ever find out that you were dating Danny, Daniel? Eventually. Well, how long into their relationship was that? Say five years. Five years. So that brings you up to 2008 or 2009? 2008. 2007, 2008. And how do they find out? My mother saw him dropping me off at the loca at Pacific Mall where they come to pick me up. And how did that go over? Not well. Explain to me what not well means. My mother, she said at first she was like not supportive, but she said, you need to tell me. And she basically gave me the, um, the sex talk, which basically was, one moment could ruin your entire life. Um, but once my father found out, without even knowing him, he automatically put judgment. What kind of judgment did your father pass on him? He blamed my lying and even racial um, profiling on him. And what does that mean? I don't know about the racial profile. Um, he is half Filipino, half Chinese. Yes. And my father associated him with Filipino and said that, you know, he wasn't a good match for me. He wasn't going anywhere in life and um, that he wouldn't be able to support a family. So tell me about, about Daniel. Uh, we've interviewed Daniel. Okay. Daniel Wong had been called in the day before and interviewed. He was already on the list to be interviewed, but after the tip about his drug convictions, he moved further up that list. Dressed in a black sweater and glasses, he looked tired and a little unkempt. He said he had a cold. He had a good rapport with Detective Robert Milligan, who was interviewing him. Milligan started the interview by saying, Just so you know, we interview everybody. Everybody who has known the family at some point in the last 10, 15 years. So we can say we interviewed everybody. So you're not anything special compared to everybody else. 
Daniel, who was 25 years old, was calm and relaxed throughout his entire interview. Even when asked pointed questions about his drug dealing history, he answered calmly and confidently. Daniel relayed his past with Jennifer. He told Milligan about their on and off relationship, which ended about two years prior, when her parents found out and delivered an ultimatum. They were forced apart by Jennifer's parents, and he said he respected that. Okay, again, like, I don't know whether who was, who was behind it, right? I just know that her parents didn't want us to be, her family didn't want us to be together. Um, and I respected that decision and I moved on. Now, why didn't her family want you to be together? I don't know. There's so many different, like, I asked her the first time and she said it was um, because I didn't make enough money. Like, I was working at Boston Pizza and she told them that I finished engineering. And they're like, oh, well, why do you finish engineering and just work at Boston Pizza? Why doesn't he go and make 60, 70,000 being an engineer? And then, and then after that, the next time I asked her, she's like, it's not even about how much money you make, it's the fact that you're Filipino. And I'm like, how is that possible when your cousin just married a Filipino guy? Mm-hmm. She's like, well, my, nobody in the family likes him, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. So there's always a reason why we couldn't be together, like that her parents, I don't know. Other reasons? Sorry? Is there other reasons? No, those were the, the, the reasons. But what do you, th- what is, what do you think? Because you've been in the industry, you've, dealt with pound, Mm -hmm. a pound, you won't say you've dealt with over and I won't have to go there. But in the industry, what do you think people would kill somebody over? Give me a number. If if someone were to, it'd have to be around ten thousand dollars. Someone would like I'd I'd pretty much be sure for about ten thousand dollars someone would do something like that. Daniel described the seven years of his and Jennifer's relationship behind her parents' backs and started to unravel the twisted ball of bizarre behaviours and lies that Jennifer used to keep up the charade to her family. Daniel said to Detective Milligan that when the final ultimatum came from Jennifer's parents to end their relationship, he knew it was for the best. He knew they had no long-term life together. He had never spent more than a few minutes with Han and Bikar in all that time never shared a meal, or even had a conversation with him. He accepted it and moved on. He said, she was a prisoner. It was hard. Daniel said since their breakup in 2009, they had more or less been estranged. Describing their infrequent conversations, he said, she tries to call me. If I answer, I answer. Or I'll call her, sort of thing, just to see how she's doing. He said Jennifer never had any involvement with his drug dealing. He told her never to touch it. Detective Milligan was interested in the reason why an estranged ex-couple had been in quite a lot of contact in the previous few months. Daniel said, Lately, it's just been happening more and more. An unknown person would call and I'd answer and it would just go quiet for 10 seconds and then they'd hang up. It would happen over and over. And when I would not answer, it would get worse and worse. It got ridiculous. It was up to 100 times a night. Over time, Daniel says he began receiving text messages of a more threatening nature. Texts like, ha ha ha, bang bang bang. He said Jennifer had contacted him complaining that she too was receiving similar messages, so that's why they had been in frequent contact in recent times. Daniel admitted he was worried that he would be targeted next. He said, yeah, I am worried for my safety. I haven't slept, because I don't know who it is. If it's the crank callers, they call my house, they call my cell phone, so they have my address. It's pretty obvious. If they got access to finding her address through her phone number, they can find my address through my phone number. My mum couldn't sleep either. It kept going through my head. Who could it be? Who is it? Is it really just a random break and enter? It's actually the phone calls and the other stuff that I think it's related to. The following day in Jennifer's interview, she told Detective Slade she was given the ultimatum by her parents a year and a half earlier, when she was about 23. When they caught her the last time seeing Daniel, She says her father told her she must either choose Daniel or choose them. She said she chose to stay home with her family. Han's words to Jennifer were, Cease your relationship with Daniel Wong. If not, you have to wait till I'm dead. Even as an adult in her 20s, her parents were still controlling every aspect of her life. The reasons why were starting to become clear.
After being snubbed valedictorian in grade 8 and not doing as well academically as she had hoped, things started to spiral for Jennifer. Karen Ho, a journalist who went to school with Jennifer, wrote an article for Toronto Life. The following is taken from that article. Quote, A close observer might have noticed that Jennifer seemed off, but I never did. I was a year behind her at Mary Ward Catholic Secondary in North Scarborough. As far as Catholic schools go, it was something of an anomaly. It had the usual high academic standards and strict dress code, mixed with a decidedly bohemian vibe. It was easy to find your tribe. Bright kids and arty misfits hung out together across subjects, grades and social groups. If you played three instruments, took advanced classes, competed on the ski team and starred in the school's annual international night, a showcase of various cultures around the world, you were cool. It was the perfect community for a student like Jennifer, a social butterfly with an easy, high-pitched laugh she mixed with guys, girls, Asians, Caucasians, jocks, nerds, people deep into the arts. At five foot seven, she was taller than most of the other Asian girls at the school, and pretty, but plain. She rarely wore makeup. She had small, round, wireframe glasses that were neither stylish nor expensive, and she kept her hair straight and unstyled. Jennifer and I both played the flute, though she was in the senior stage band and I was in junior. We would interact in the band room, had dozens of mutual acquaintances, and were friends on Facebook. In conversation, she always seemed focused on the moment. If you had her attention, you had it completely. End quote from the article. It was at this time in Jennifer's life that she started to turn away from studying hard and stopped dedicating herself to school. Instead of getting straight A's, she was averaging 70% in all her classes and barely achieving B's. Not quite the high marks she needed to get into the pharmacology program at the University of Toronto. Her father expected his children would be the top of their classes to get into the best college, which would lead them to high paying careers. So B's weren't going to cut it. And so started a decade of lies that would spin so deep, even Jennifer got confused between what was a lie and what was the truth. Instead of telling her parents about her high school grades, she decided to forge her report cards. She used templates from old reports, used scissors, glue, and photocopied them to create new ones. Jennifer also started cutting herself. Small cuts on her forearms. It was a hint of her hidden torment behind the happy mask she was wearing at the time. Her parents were proud when she brought home A's. They were thrilled when she graduated high school and they were so proud when she received scholarship letters and an early admission offer into Ryerson University. It wasn't Toronto University, but she planned to start a science degree and move over to Toronto after a couple of years. She had worked hard in her parents' eyes and was achieving what they had only imagined possible for her. Han was so pleased that he bought her a laptop. But there was one problem. Jennifer didn't graduate high school. She failed her last semester of calculus, a high school subject she would have to repeat in order to graduate. She failed high school and Ryerson withdrew their offer. Instead of coming clean, Jennifer's spiral of lies grew deeper. She spent the summer preparing for university. She bought second-hand biology and physics books and set the wheels in motion for beginning the academic year. In September, she pretended to attend her orientation week. She forged papers stating she was receiving a loan that she would pay off and convinced her dad she'd won a $3,000 scholarship. She pretended to make her way to the university campus half an hour away, and even accepted lifts from her parents. Day after day, she was keeping up the charade. She would pack her book bag and go to the library filling notebooks full of pretend class notes, and she searched the web for course-related topics. By this time, Daniel Wong was at York University taking classes, and they were seeing each other in secret. Her parents had found out about their relationship and put a stop to it immediately. Jennifer just told them what they wanted to hear, that her and Daniel had broken up, but then she went behind their backs. She spent a lot of her spare time visiting Daniel at York. She took on a part-time job, taught piano lessons, and later on worked at Boston Pizza where Daniel worked as a kitchen manager. He knew she was faking her studies, and he helped her hide the secret. Jennifer came up with a false acceptance letter into the pharmacology program at the University of Toronto, complete with a made-up scholarship for tuition. She continued to tell her parents she was staying with her friend a couple of nights a week. As her parents saw it, she was working hard towards her goals, and they supported her. It wasn't just her family she was lying to, friends too. 
She over-exaggerated her father's control, telling friends he had hired a private investigator to follow her, so her friends thought Jennifer had no other choice but to live a lie. In February 2009, Jennifer wrote two separate Facebook posts. The first, living in my house is like living under house arrest. And the second, no one person knows everything about me, and no two people put together know everything about me. I like being a mystery. She wasn't afraid of letting people know about her parents' controlling ways. Han and Bikar could not have been more proud than they were when Jennifer came home and told them she had been given a volunteer position at the Toronto Hospital for Sick Children in a blood testing lab. They understood when the position started, Jennifer would be required for late night shifts and weekends. Jennifer suggested it might be better if she spent more nights at her friend's place. Bikar convinced Han to let her stay away. When it came time to graduate from the University of Toronto, Daniel helped Jennifer hire someone online to fake a full college graduation transcript, complete with straight A's. She told her parents that the graduating class was so large that there weren't enough seats for two guests each, and so she was only allowed to invite one person. She said she couldn't possibly choose between her two parents, so she would take a friend instead. When her dad asked her where the pictures were, she made up an excuse. In September 2009, just over a year before the home invasion, Han noticed that Jennifer didn't have any uniform for her hospital job, nor did she have any form of ID which he knew hospitals required. The following day, without saying anything to Jennifer, he insisted that he and her mother drive her to the hospital. They dropped her off and Han parked the car. He asked Big Har to follow their daughter in to see where she went. Jennifer knew her mother was following her, so she went to the waiting room of the ER and hid for three hours until she was sure they were gone. The next morning, Han called Topaz, Jennifer's friend she had been staying with. Except Topaz told Han Jennifer hadn't been staying with her at all. When Jennifer arrived home that day, her father and mother were waiting for her. They wanted to know what the hell was going on. Jennifer confessed she wasn't volunteering at the hospital. She had never been enrolled at the University of Toronto, and she had not studied pharmacology for the four years prior. It had all been a lie. She also confessed that she had been living three days a week with Daniel and his family. Jennifer never lived with Topaz. She had never stayed there. Monday through Wednesday, she stayed with Daniel and his family. She was a part of Daniel's family, and meanwhile her parents didn't even know they were still in contact. Jennifer had told Daniel's parents that Han and Bikar were okay with her living with them half the week. They repeatedly asked to meet her parents, but she always had an excuse. Han and Bikar ordered her to reapply for the University of Toronto to gain her degree. She had her credits from Ryerson behind her. She would have no problem. But she did have a problem. She never went to Ryerson. But she didn't confess that to them. She kept the charade going that she had partially studied at Ryerson University. She didn't want to come clean about everything, and if they were this mad about her lying about Toronto University... How would they react if they found out she never finished high school and never went to Ryerson? Han and Big Heart felt like they didn't know their own daughter. She was a stranger in her own family. Han tried to kick Jennifer out of the house. She was a disgrace to the family. What she had done was unforgivable. He never wanted to see her again. Big Heart was devastated, but she was also devastated to think what might happen to her daughter if they kicked her out. She convinced Han to let her stay. For two weeks, Jennifer was housebound, her mother by her side nearly constantly. She wasn't allowed to go anywhere on her own. She had her cell phone and laptop taken away, and she was forced to quit all her jobs except piano tutoring, where they could keep an eye on her. She was forced to repay her parents for all the money they had given her for her studies. They eventually found out about high school too, and Jennifer was forced to go back to complete the high school calculus course and start the process again for her future. She was given a strict curfew of 9pm, and every aspect of her life was monitored. Over the months that followed, her mother occasionally weakened enough to allow Jennifer to know where her dad had hidden her phone, allowing her to check her messages. Bikar sometimes stood up for Jennifer during arguments she had with her father. Bikar sometimes said that Han had to remember she had already grown up. Let her be herself. Too much interference will not be good. So although sticking by her husband and following his wishes, a piece of her understood her daughter's torment. 
Once Jennifer started to gain back some trust with her parents, they eased up and allowed her to have restricted time with her phone and to sometimes go places alone. They still checked her messages and the odometer on the car though. Jennifer and Daniel would sneak phone calls and she would often ask a mutual friend Gary to drive her to Daniel's and pick her up again, still lying to her parents about where she was. She continued to visit Daniel in secret, even sneaking out overnight, arranging her bed covers to look like she was in bed. But her mum found out. She was grounded completely and now even her mother wanted her to be completely cut off from Daniel. In 2009, around a year before the home invasion, Daniel had grown sick of their secret relationship. By then, Jennifer was 24, and they were still sneaking around like teenagers. He was tired of the threats her parents constantly made, and the fact that Jennifer wouldn't stand up to them and move out. He broke it off for good, and by February 2010, he was seeing a new girlfriend, Christine. Jennifer was desperate to hold on to Daniel. She was adamant that they still needed each other, and she went to extreme lengths to gain his attention. In Jennifer's second interview, she admitted to Detective Slade that over the months that followed their breakup, she lied to Daniel to get his attention. Early in 2010, Jennifer made up a story where she answered the door of her home to find a man posing as a police officer. She said that he and other men then forced their way in and sexually assaulted her. She told Daniel she knew it was Christine who had arranged the attack, as a warning to stay away from Daniel. She also admitted to lying about a string of text message threats and to receiving a bullet through the mail as part of a death threat. Jennifer couldn't handle being without Daniel, so she tried to come up with a plan that would keep them together. By the end of Jennifer's second interview with Slade, he told Jennifer he was grateful she had been honest, to which she replied, There is also one other thing. We were getting private phone calls at my house as well. I never told my brother because he was at school. When we picked up, they would always hang up. Like I said, Mondays my mother would go dancing, and one time while she was gone, the phone rang. I picked it up. My father was already on the phone. There was a woman on the other line. I don't know who it was, and they were speaking Chinese. My father didn't know I was on the line, but this woman was saying, you have to come over right away, right away, you have to come now. And my father kept saying, I can't come now. The woman said, I don't care. You have to come, now. Jennifer explained to Detective Slade that her father left the house in a hurry, saying he had to go and fix a leaking tap at her aunt's place, but she didn't believe the woman to be her auntie. After hearing this, Slade left the room. Jennifer started to breathe heavily. She got up and started pacing. After 25 minutes, an officer walked in and offered to take Jennifer to the bathroom and offered her candy. Jennifer accepted. Afterwards, they both returned to the room, and the officer stayed with Jennifer. Barely audible, Jennifer spat out words with no consistency while pacing back and forth. I'm just beating myself up. He's asking me these questions like I should have been more attentive, but it just happened so fast, and it's like, and I can't give him the answers, and I don't know. I wish I was able to answer. I want to be able to answer it, so it would help. Jennifer turned to the officer and asked, have they been able to find out anything? Do they have any leads or suspects? Does anyone know where the car went after? She didn't get an answer. Jennifer whispered a little to herself and started rocking. After nearly 30 minutes, Detective Slade returned. Hi, Jennifer. Hey. Here. Take some Kleenex. Take some Kleenex. Tell me what you're feeling right now. What's going on? You might as well get used to this. You gotta get it out. So tell me what you're feeling right now. I'm just kind of like, if it makes me feel like I should have. It's a thing called survivor's guilt, okay, that you're going to go through. That you're going to, you're going to, and this is like the, the, the stuff about the therapy and, and getting to speak to someone because there's stages of grieving that you're going to go through, okay? And this is the only way you're going to go through this is with, properly is with help. And I think victim services is engaged, right? They're, they're trying to help you. So just stick with that. Okay? It's a long road, but it's, it can be a very successful road. 
okay? And, and uh, what you're feeling, I hate to say, is normal, but it is. It's something that a lot of people who are in the same circumstance will feel, okay? But I, I, what I want to do is I want to finish off on this so that we can let you go and get, and, and get, get out of the police station. Okay, because I appreciate your time and I appreciate your help. So, what is in the safe? Um, the last time I opened it, my mom took out our passports, and I, I, she's the, she has the combination. I don't have the combination. You don't have the combination for the safe? No. Just your mom? Just my mom. Okay, and so there was passports, no large quantities of cash in there. Mm. Not that I, not that I know of, because okay. she asked me to help pay for our two trips. Okay. <laughs> and what did you get? The, what did you have the two thousand dollars for? What did you? Where did you make that money? I had. I was saving up to get a new cell phone. Do you have a BlackBerry? I gave it to Daniel. Okay. My the, brother gave it to me from his friend. But you have, so the BlackBerry, is it in your name that you've given no. to Daniel? So is Dan, it was yours and you've given it to my, Daniel? My brother's friend didn't, it was an old BlackBerry, and my brother's friend gave it to him. And I gave it, I gave it to Daniel. When did you give it to Daniel? Um, I gave it to a friend to give to Daniel. How long ago? A couple, maybe a week. A week ago? A week, maybe a week. Okay. What's the PIN command for that? You know, do you have a personal identification number for security reasons? Have you ever been given that by, by BlackBerry? No. No? There's, there's no lock that I know. Okay. So, um... Daniel is, was, and likely still remains to be a drug dealer. Self-admitted when he was in the air the other day. Now, so stepping back from that is, I had asked you is prior to the incident, when's the last time you spoke to Daniel? What I should have said to you is, when is the last time from today for, back that you spoke to Daniel? When is the last time you met with him and spoke with him? I saw him here yesterday when I was leaving. Did you talk to him? Just briefly. You didn't see him or talk to him any other times other than right here in the police station? And if I told you that Daniel says that you spoke to him, you did have a conversation with him somewhere else? He would be lying? The last time I spoke to him was when he asked for the Blackberry. And that was a week ago? Yes, because my grandfather had just, he was in the hospital and I snuck over and dropped it off for a friend at his paintball place. And who is the friend that you gave it to? I only know his first name. Uh, Hessen. Hessen? And where's the paintball place? Uh, Victoria Park in McNichol. Right at Victoria Park in McNichol? Uh, between McNichol and Steeles on Victoria Park. When... There's a lot of people. Remember I told you about the media? They're bad. They can be very bad when they start to sniff around and they, they sense something. And I can tell you that the media is portraying that this was supposed to be some sort of drug related, that you guys weren't a random target, that you were a targeted house because of drug activity. What would you say to that? I don't deal the drugs. Okay. Tell me more about that. You don't deal the drugs. Are you involved in the transportation and dis no. distribution? No. Have you ever been with Danny? This is something that's very important. Have you ever been with Danny when Danny's doing that? He normally leaves me with a friend and says he's going out with his friend. 
the so when you go out and see him for once during the time once once a week i i tell my parents that i was going to class yes and before class or after class i'd go buy him lunch and bring it by his work and sometimes i would see him and sometimes i'd just give it to a coworker to give to him and how long when you see him how long would you see him for 10 minutes 15 minutes cuz he was working uh, when you weren't when he wasn't working and you were able to get out and see him how long Dad, it hasn't happened in a long time. And how long's a long time? The last time I saw him outside of that was when Gary picked me up and I got caught by my parents. And that was, I'd say, a year, if not a year and a half almost. And why, why did he want your BlackBerry? He said that he had sold his BlackBerry, so he needed a phone. And that BlackBerry... What like I'm I'm kind of confused. Is was that an active phone? No. Because now we're talking Which, about three phones. Now we're talking. We got a SIM card. We got the phone that your parents know you have, and you got a BlackBerry. Up until a week ago. Yes. So the BlackBerry is what I was using with my own Roger SIM card. The phone I'm using now was an old phone that I no longer used. Okay, so because the reception was no good. The BlackBerry was your normal phone that yes. you were using on a regular basis. Yes. And um, and you would switch SIM cards. If, so if you were going to communicate with him with the other SIM card, you'd put the SIM card in that BlackBerry and talk to him through that? I had an iPhone. That you had I an kept, iPhone? I kept in my room that my parents didn't know about because um, my brother, I had one that Daniel gave me earlier, but it broke. Yeah. So my brother, he, what he did was he fixed the part so he can have one that he used himself. But uh, the one I had wasn't fully functioning. It was just able, uh, it had no internet access on it. So I just kept it for phone calls, and I kept it hidden. And where is that phone now? It should be still on my, in my room. Yes, where? Uh, I believe it was on my laptop table or something, or on my counter. And it doesn't have a SIM card in it right now? No, I don't keep the SIM card in it, just in case my parents asked. Okay, so there's an iPhone on by your desk? On your desk, somewhere yes. in that in your room. Yes. And um, the Rogers, the, I mean the BlackBerry that you had had up until a week, and it went to Daniel. And and for what reason it went to Daniel? He had a black, another, a newer BlackBerry, but he said someone wanted to buy it, like a friend of his wanted to buy it, and that he needed a phone temporarily. So, so I, he took your phone. So I, I had another phone as well. So I said, okay, I'll lend you this one. So, um, it sounds as if you couldn't let Danny go. Like, you're, you're still there. You're still hoping. The hope isn't much, but... But it, you're still hoping. I still can't. You're not, you're not walking away from him, right? You haven't walked away from him, even with the comments that you've received, these comments from... I had, and then... But I had for a while... I disappeared from him for a while, but I needed, it was just, he, he's that calm, that he can, he can make me calm, so I reached back out to him. So is the, is it you instigating all the communication, or does he reach back, does he start? He reached back as well. Okay. Now, you have to figure, as I said, the media can be horrific in some cases and I, I told you not to read or pay attention to the news mm. and I know for a fact that in one of the newspapers that the angle that's being portrayed right now is that this was a drug that you guys were um, uh, not a random but a targeted residence because of drug related activity you and your family were engaged in drug related activity now is it possible that Danny that you are being mistaken somehow as being involved in his life and that angle of things. Well, I haven't been around his life for a while, like going out with him. But I wouldn't say it's completely out of the question, but I haven't, I don't, I don't go around with him when he's doing that kind of stuff. I, I don't like it and I refuse to be a part of that. Then they started talking about Daniel's girlfriend, Christine. Jennifer encouraged the conversation when it steered towards Christine being involved in drug running. Detective Slade asked, 
how would you feel if Daniel is the one, through whatever activity, who has brought this back to you? Jennifer didn't reply. Counting both interviews, Slade had by now interviewed Jennifer for over five hours. Just over the five hour mark, he asked. So you're telling me that you you had no involvement in what happened? Meaning not saying how the outcome came, but you you had no involvement in, in any type of illegal activity that would have drawn you or the attention of you to have bad people come to your house looking for large sums of money. You're not involved in this any which way. Because the question obviously stands, Jennifer, is you're upstairs and they're downstairs. No. Right? So it's a natural concern when why would they leave you alone? Why would they not do the same to you? You can't answer that question? The only thing I can say is he said I cooperated. The, but I asked him to take me. The number one guy? The number one guy said you cooperated. Okay. There's no, you had no threats. And again, we're back to the fact that you admittedly lied. Okay, not to me, right? No. Not to me. No. You admittedly lied. You've lied to your parents, right? About going to school. You've lied to, to Danny about being, Daniel about being raped and about receiving a bullet. Who's to say this whole thing isn't a lie? that what you're telling me is a lie. Because if you are lying, it's the most cold-blooded thing that I have ever faced in my life. There is nothing that you've said to me today is a lie. And I, I want to... They want to just put a little preamble. Not nothing in here that you might have mistaken because of order of events. I'm saying to you right now, is there anything throughout the course of your statement today where you've lied to me? From your interaction with Danny, Daniel, from your... I'm not involved in drugs and I don't have anything to do with them and we don't have large sums of money. What about life insurance policies? Do your parents have life insurance policies? I I think I I don't know. Don't I know, know they had a they had a I I have one of myself. Yes. And uh my mom uh, they used to have one for me when I was younger. Okay. But uh, half of that went to education, half went to uh, life insurance. And when they found out I, I, uh, I didn't go to university, they, they asked for the money back. So hang on a second here. You told, to me that, you told me that they never knew you didn't go to university. When did they find out that you didn't go to university? I told them that I graduated, but I never went to university. That I went for two years, but I never finished. Okay. And they wanted the money back as a result of that? Yes. So you did actually tell your parents somewhat of the truth that you never went to university, or, but it's, it's half truths. Yes. So, back to this line is um, where we're talking about the fact that, uh, of the line, right? Is that it's I a, don't deal the drugs. I don't associate with that. Okay. I honest I don't. Now back to another very difficult question. But if I don't ask it, I'm going to be you, it's an obvious one. The resentment that you had that you may have had towards your parents for the interference in your relationship and your life and essentially locking you down in your house. At the end of the day, I love my parents and I chose to be with them. And if I wanted to I could have just left but I didn't I wanted to stay with them and take care of them 
So this wasn't some evil plot that you thought up to... Oh my God, no. No interaction, no belief, no... You didn't have anything to do with this thing at all, whatsoever. No. You don't engage in illegal activity? No. Because you know that it'll be very easy... It, it will be a very easy thing to discredit you on, right? We're, we're in the process of trying to add credibility to what you tell us, and that's through the process of asking people and doing whatever. Through that same process, it will be very easy to find the flaws in what you've said, which again then turns the focus back to you. Okay? I don't... It's a natural progress. It's a natural thing that investigators do. We eliminate people or we draw our attention to them. It's a natural uh, thing. It's, a, it's not brain surgery. Okay? Detective Slade left the room briefly, and when he re-entered, Jennifer told him he gave her a fright. Slade asked her to sit down. He said the interview was over. He told her he didn't want her walking away thinking that he was evil for asking some tough questions. He wanted her to know he was going to turn over every stone to help catch the people responsible for her mum's murder. He said, Sometimes we have to ask really difficult questions, but it's my job. I hope you understand. I understand that it's just... hard to take. Have you lied to me? No. no? You haven't lied to me about anything? I said whatever I could to help. Okay. So, if you've always told the truth, the truth will never hurt you. It may get you into a bit of trouble, right? The truth can get you into trouble if you've done some things wrong. But generally, in most cases, if you tell the truth, you'll always be fine. So that's, that's the avenue. That, that, that's the avenue you have to think about. And, and what you, I can always, I never do anything wrong if I tell the truth. And if I've, made, if I've said some things that are lies or I've held something back because I think it might hurt me, those are the things that will cause people to look at you more intently. Because the question is, is why would that person do that to me? They've got something to hide, right? So... You know, the fact that you've lied to your parents over a long period of time, the fact that you've lied about to Daniel about those other two events, you know, those are disturbing. But I don't live in your shoes, and I would never judge you on that fact, but from an outsider looking in, to have to live under those conditions, to have to lie continually, you're going to ask the question, why? And if that's the way that you have to live, that's the way you have to live. But people will judge you on your life. Right? My concern lies in the fact of your lying. Okay? You've come clean. You've never lied to me before. Right? I've never met you to be a liar. But the fact is, is that you've lied about stuff to Daniel. You've lied to your parents. So, could you be lying to me? I can't. Why couldn't you be lying to me? Because you're scaring me. Doesn't mean that I, you couldn't be lying to me, right? I don't know you. I've known you now for probably five hours intermittent. I hope you're not lying to me, right? That's all I can hope for. But the fact of the matter is, is that those three things are sitting there saying, you know, like... You have the ability to trick your parents for a long period of time. They just weren't in tune with what I was doing. Very explainable, and I also weren't. Li I wasn't living where you are, right? And I'm, so I'm not going to prejudge you because I, people do what they need to do to survive. So it could very easily be justified as a survival mechanism. This is the best avenue that you sought, and you were stuck in it. Okay, but the fact is, is that my job is is trying to get the root of a, of a very serious crime and I have to explore every avenue that we possibly can. So I'm gonna do everything in my power to either prove us as, as our police agency, prove or disprove what you've told us. The more we prove or can cooperate, the more credibility you, you have as, as a witness, okay? That's gonna happen. 
We may even ask you to come back again. Again, it will be not for, you will not be explaining what happened in a grand scheme of things because you've done that up and down and backwards. It may be for points of clarification. Okay, because again, we're speaking to, we're going to be going and likely speaking to some of your friends and your relatives, and it's just points of clarification. It may not happen. It, it may, you know, I'm only saying that it may. I told you I didn't want to do the five and six and seven interviews with you. Well, after today, that's not going to happen. But we may be contacting you to help us for some other points that we come across. After her interview, Jennifer went to visit her father at hospital with her brother Felix. She was chased through the hospital car park by reporters. Felix helped to shield her from the press. Jennifer covered her face underneath the hood of her jacket, but was photographed when she looked up to see where she was going. The following day, Han Pan woke up from a three-day induced coma. Doctors were unable to remove the bullet fragments lodged in his face, and he was facing a long recovery from a shattered neck bone but the emotional recovery would take much longer. Han remembered what happened instantly and relived the shock of losing his wife. His brother sat by his bedside and told him the things that had been happening the last three days. The first thing he told Han was that while he was in a coma, Bikar's father, Jennifer's grandfather, had passed away. Bikar's family believed he passed away from grief. Then he told Han about Jennifer borrowing some change and making a phone call from a payphone pretending her phone ran out of battery. Jennifer's family knew she was lying and her phone wasn't out of battery. After allowing him a brief conversation with his brother, detectives interviewed Han. Jennifer was not allowed to see or speak to her father until detectives finished questioning him. Detectives Marco Napoleoni and David McDonald entered the hospital room. They found Han propped up in bed, almost unable to speak, having to breathe through a mouthpiece, his face swollen from his injuries. Han revealed disturbing memories etched in his mind of the home invasion. He recalled that while one of the men was moving Jennifer, he saw his daughter chatting softly with him, like a friend. He revealed that during the time he and Bikar were being threatened with guns and led away, Jennifer's arms were not tied behind her back. Han said, she was comfortable and freely moving around the house. They talked at length about Jennifer's odd behaviour. They talked about her past. They talked about her lying. The officers knew Han believed his daughter had something to hide. Han looked both detectives square in the eye and said, Use your police tactics to find out who did this. Han said that he did not want to see his daughter, and Jennifer was told not to visit him. Even though Han's family had to wait to see him properly, their happiness at his recovery was evident as they gathered ready to help him through his grief and recovery. Jennifer, however, sought out the hospital therapist, having a breakdown over how this was all affecting her. She did not appear to be grieving her mother, and she showed no concern for her father. She was more worried about how she was being portrayed in the media. Her self-absorption did not go unnoticed to those around her. Two days later, after Han had been interviewed for the second time, Jennifer snuck into his room in the hospital, in a rare moment where she wasn't being monitored by someone. Han asked her if she thought Daniel was behind the murder. She replied, I don't know 100%, but I don't think he was. Han also asked Jennifer if it was Daniel who she called from the payphone right after she discovered he was going to survive. Jennifer admitted to the call, but said it was only to share the good news. Jennifer then asked her dad for $1,200 for college tuition. That day, Detective Curtis officially made Jennifer a suspect in the investigation. Jennifer started making arrangements for both her mother's and grandfather's funerals. Jennifer complained to friends that her father left her to arrange the funerals by herself. Han chose to pay his respects to his wife in private and not attend her funeral. He was still awaiting surgery to remove bullet fragments from his face. At the chapel, Jennifer and Felix held each other. Police were also in attendance. This gruesome murder happened in their community and they wanted to pay their respects but they were also there to see how their new suspect behaved. Here's what one officer said. She's up there rubbing her eyes, then looking up at us, then rubbing her eyes again, but never crying. That funeral really got to me. Don't be looking at us when you're paying your respects to your mum who was just killed. She wasn't crying, her head was down. It was like she was crying. 
but with no tears. With the funerals over, Jennifer's family became vocal about their confusion over her behaviour. She was confronted by her uncle, who told her he remembered seeing her a few months earlier at a coffee shop with a black male. Jennifer brushed it off. On Monday, November 22nd, a week and a half after her last statement, Jennifer was called back in for questioning. This time she was being questioned by Detective William Gates. He went through the formalities and mentioned to Jennifer that she had the right to a lawyer, but she was not under arrest. The tone was different to the last two police interviews. It was more formal. Gates asked Jennifer lots of personal questions about her friends, her hobbies, and herself as a person. He then started to delve into how she was treated by her parents. Jennifer quietly described their expectations. She described how during school her parents compared her to other people, often saying she should be more like them. She confirmed there was never any physical abuse of any kind. Gates asked, Did you ever feel like you weren't as smart as they thought you were? It was pretty tough to live up to their expectations. Jennifer agreed. He then asked, And their expectations were so high that few people could ever reach those expectations. Jennifer agreed. The interview continued on a much more personal note. They discussed how events with Daniel and her family made her feel. It became clear that Jennifer didn't really know where she stood with Daniel. One day he said he saw a future with her, the next day he said the opposite. She was asked if she felt it was fair that at the age of 24 she had to stay at home with a curfew of 9pm. Jennifer said, Considering my past, I understood. They talked about the call Jennifer made to Andrew on the day of the home invasion. They also discussed the time when she met Andrew's roommate, Ricardo, a person she hadn't yet mentioned and who we will get to in a minute. They got onto the subject of the attackers. Gates said, Now, obviously we have spoken to a lot of people, and one of your relatives has told us that you said that these guys liked you. Why did you say that? Jennifer, I didn't say that. I said I asked them why, when they separated me from my parents in the house, why couldn't I be with them? And they said, You've cooperated. Just keep on cooperating. Okay, so you've made that comment to a relative though, that they liked you. Did you feel they liked you? Jennifer. No. They had a gun to my head. Why did they not shoot you? I'm, I don't know. When, I, when they took my parents away, I asked to go with them and they were like, shut up. But you must have thought of this. You must be thinking. I, I still do, and I, I still think they're okay. And why do you, what have you come up with in your mind? Why? The only thing they, they could say was they kept saying that, you know, I cooperated and to shut up and to cooperate, keep cooperating. Did you feel you, like your parents didn't cooperate? I don't know. Okay. Is there something that they didn't cooperate with? They were trying. That's what I mean. Like, so really they did cooperate when you think about it. There was no money to be found. No. They told the truth. Dad said he had $60, right? Um, so there wasn't anything that he wasn't cooperating with. I don't know. I'm just trying to say you were there. I'm just trying to get a feel for Did you think he wasn't cooperating? No. I thought that he was, everyone was cooperating. That's what they kept saying. No one would get hurt if he just cooperated. Okay. I'm trying to figure out where they didn't cooperate. Now, do you think there's any reason why they tied you up and didn't tie your parents up? I don't know. Does that seem odd to you? Why does it seem odd? Because I was away, um, I was pretty separated from the whole time. And does it make sense that they would leave a witness behind? If they were going to kill somebody? Does that make sense? I guess I think. Just thinking about it. Would it make sense for somebody that was going to kill somebody to leave a witness behind that could describe them? Does that make common sense for killers? 
Gates went over Jennifer's previous statements and clarified a few points. He asked her much finer details than she had been asked previously. Jennifer struggled to answer. He scrutinised the evening and the moments before the home invasion, and Jennifer became visibly upset. She struggled to get any words out. Her voice was timid. The questions were very detailed. Gates drooled her about the time frame between when her mum came home from dancing and when the intruders broke in. Jennifer said she went down to say hello and get a glass of water. The water was a new detail. He asked her where exactly she got the water from. He asked her if at any time when she was downstairs did she check if the house was secure. She said no, that's what the last person who goes to bed does. He asked her specifically if she checked the front door. She said no. Gates then asked her if it would be typical that if her mother arrived home late at night, like she had done on this particular night, that she would automatically lock the front door as she went inside. As Gates asked this question, Jennifer sat up straight and looked at him. It's the most attention she had given him throughout the interview. Almost two hours into the interview, Detective Gates stepped out of the room. By this point, Jennifer was completely bent over with her face in her hands. She was whimpering and breathing deeply. When Detective Gates walked back into the room, he had some news. Now, the reason why I'm here today, okay, is that I'm an expert, okay, in what we call truth verification. Okay, I'm not a homicide detective, okay, although I work on a lot of homicides, okay? So my job in any case, and anybody that's a witness in this case, I have to speak to them, okay, after they've been interviewed originally by anybody else, okay? And so what it's about is truth verification, okay? So basically all my studies come into interviewing and uh, detecting deception, uh, determine if somebody's telling the police the truth, okay? Gates explained to Jennifer that he had physically written out the entire two statements she had previously given to Detective Slade, every word, every syllable. He told her he is trained to notice when someone is speaking in a style of language which differs from their usual style. They don't even know they are doing it. There is even software that helps them determine whether certain words or statements ring alarm bells. Jennifer learnt that the software they used to analyse her statement was event probability analysis. Her statement was fed into the computer, it analysed what she said and it told them areas of deception or areas of concern within her statement. Gates then went into minute detail about the level of forensic examination that had occurred at her house. How they now knew exactly where and when people were in the rooms of the house on the night of the invasion. They knew which rooms people were not in. He then mentioned the door locks and latches. As Jennifer nodded her head and twirled her hair, Gates explained that they could tell with layers of fingerprints who touched the door lock last, possibly to unlock it after someone else had already locked it. Over and over, Gates dropped the hints, and Jennifer took them. She realised she was in trouble. As Gates continued, Jennifer hung her head lower and lower. I am well aware that anybody on this earth is capable of making a mistake. Okay? I don't care who they are. I don't care um, if they're a priest. I don't care if they're a school teacher. I don't care what the situation is. Given a certain set of circumstances, Everyone has the capability, Jennifer, of making a mistake, doing the wrong thing, okay? Um, the key, though, when I talk to people is when they made a mistake, okay, that's one thing, right? The key is to not keep making the same mistake, okay? And to get that information out and get it off their chest, okay? You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so at the end of the day, from this case, and I can tell you I've spent literally a week on this case going over information after information, accessing all these sources, speaking to every other expert on the case, okay? And at this point, Jennifer, I know that you've not been truthful with the police, okay? You've not told us everything that you know, purposely, 
okay? And that you've left information out, okay? There's a number of inconsistencies in what you've told the police, okay? One of the things you have to remember is that your dad was there, okay? And your dad had a front row seat to all of this, okay? And your dad's a very smart man, okay? And he has a very clear perception of what's going on. And he tells a very truthful story, because I've gone through this whole process with him. Okay, I've had to do the same thing. And I know he's being truthful, okay? The problem is that your story, what you're telling is not truthful, okay? And we have to clear this up. Okay, your rendition of what happened, one, a lot of events you say that happened never did, okay? A lot of things that you told the police happened never happened, okay? They never happened in the sequence that you've told, okay? You gotta remember that your dad was there, okay? That's just one part of it. There's lots of other things that tell me that you've not been truthful all this analysis that I've been doing. But on top of it, that yours doesn't match at all, except for very few factors that you've told truth, but you haven't told all the truth. We're getting into where, you know, you've spent a considerable amount of time in the last seven years telling half truths, okay? And I can understand why, okay? You've had a tough life, okay? What's happened to you, to me, equates to abuse, okay? And all the stresses that you've had and forced to lie, I can understand why you did it, okay? But you're in another situation here where you're under another tremendous amount of stress, okay? And that stress is brought on by those same factors that brought on stress before, okay? The number one thing that brings on stress to you is when you're not truthful right? That hurts you, right? Okay? And it doesn't feel good inside, does it? It breaks down the person that you are. Because at the end of the day, you're a good person. I know that. You've got a good heart. Okay? In this case, though, you've made mistakes. Okay? And you're involved in this. I know that. Okay? There's no question about it. Okay? The only question right now is, are you going to keep making mistakes? Are you going to go on the route that you've gone on over the years and try to pretend that things happen that never happened? Okay, are you going to not face reality here? Okay, you were not truthful to the police in this case. We know that you're involved. We've done our homework, okay? We have to resolve that now here today, okay? I need to know from you what really happened, okay? And I mean, who else is involved in this, okay? Because there's no doubt, Jennifer, that you are. Okay, we know that. We're past that, okay? There's no question about it at all, okay? And I know why this has happened, okay? You have spent your whole life trying to live up to expectations that you can't meet, okay? And it's stressed the hell out of you. You're a 24-year-old woman being treated like a 15-year-old, okay? What, you've never done anything that terrible in your life, but you're being treated like you have. You're not being treated like the adult that you are. Yes, you made some mistakes, big deal. You're not the first person that has gone out and not told their parents that they're dating a guy because in your culture, they don't accept it. I understand it. I've talked to people in here that have kept that secret for their whole life from their parents, okay? So that's not abnormal, but that puts a lot of stress on you, right? That's not easy for you, is it? No. Now, what we need to get down to here today, Jen, is what really happened. You need to tell me what went on because you know who was in that house that night. Mm -hmm. you, you do, Jen, there's no question about that, okay? There's no question about it, okay? You have actually given an improper description of the person you were dealing with, 
upstairs. Number one, you falsified the whole description of that person. We know that. Okay? We know that. Okay? He, yes, you did, Jen. Okay? You did. You made a, a mistake here. And we got to get to the bottom of that. That person did not exist in that house that night. I know that. Okay? We've done our homework. Okay? You heard on the news that there was video, right? Okay? It wasn't three black guys that left that house. You know that, and I know that. Okay? So we need to get down to why you have purposely told us a false description of number one. Okay? No, Jen. It's totally wrong. And it was done on purpose. Okay? To mislead us. Okay? Because you're involved in this. Okay? You cannot deny that. Okay? You cannot deny that. We know now. Okay? So let's just get it out on the table. You've made a mistake. I know that. Okay? But you can't live with this any longer than this. Your 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 buddy nervous wreck over this thing. This thing if you could take it back, I know that you would. If you could go back to that day and play this all over again, it would be different. Okay? But you need to right now know that we know that you're involved. There's no question about that. None whatsoever. Okay? But what we also know is that you're a good person. Okay? That's made a mistake here, right? You've, you've made some bad decisions, okay? And it's, you know, how you made the bad decisions that not talking, telling your parents what's up? You don't want to do that with us. Okay? You don't want to do that with the police, do you? Yeah, you don't want to mislead me, do you? No. Okay. So, let's not do that. You made a mistake that night. You got involved with the wrong people. Okay? You got involved in the wrong set of circumstances. Okay? But that's over with now. We're past that. Okay? We know that that happened. Okay? But, you know what? In all my years of policing, it doesn't matter what goes wrong with people, it's never too late to do the right thing. You know that, and I know that, okay? And what you can do here today is actually do the right thing, okay? You have to do the right thing, okay? You can't go around continuing this, okay? Remember when you said what it did to you when you went through those years of depression? That was brought on by not being truthful, living a lie. You don't want to keep living this lie, okay? Everybody knows, okay? You know, and you're getting the feeling from everybody around you that they know, okay? Nobody is surprised, okay? There's nobody surprised here, okay? After what you've been through, I'm surprised this didn't happen a lot earlier, truthfully. Okay, you're 24 years old, and you were a prisoner in your own house. You had lost your own identity. There was no Jennifer anymore, okay? You were living for what somebody else wanted. You weren't you. You were what somebody else wanted. You were living someone else's expectations, okay? And yes, family is important, but when family takes over you as a human being, when they take your identity, there is no more Jen. So no matter how good their intentions are, no matter how much they love you, they're taking away Jen, okay? And you have gone through this for years in the middle of tension. Tension that's got to the point that it makes you sick. Your stomach churns over it. You don't wake up a day that there's not some issue on the table, not some stress in your household, okay? Essentially, you've been told to live up to expectations. You yourself years ago knew that you could not do, okay? They're taking away Jen. There is no Jen. They took Jen away. The Jen that just wants to be a piano teacher. Why isn't that good enough? Why was that not good enough? That was great expectations. Why not just be a lab technician? Why the doctor? Why does it always have to be something bigger? Why can't it just be what you want? And all that has resulted in what's happened on, a, on November 8th. 
the tension built up to a point that, you know what, it's like an animal that gets cornered. It's, at some point, the nicest dog, when it's cornered, bites back. Three months before the home invasion, in the spring of 2010, Jennifer made contact with an old school friend called Andrew Montemere. This was the same Andrew Jennifer told Detective Slade she'd spoken to the day of the home invasion. The same Andrew that during a later account of the story, she remembered she also had a quick phone conversation with the evening of the home invasion. Andrew and Jennifer had gone to elementary school together, and she remembered him boasting that he had robbed people at knife point. She told him about how awful her home life was and how her parents controlled every detail of her existence. Andrew said he understood her pain and that he had once considered killing his own father. This planted a seed inside Jennifer, and by the early summer of 2010, she started to hatch a plan that included a world without her father in it. She went back to Andrew. Andrew introduced her to his roommate, Ricardo Dunn. They created a plan for Ricardo to murder her father in the parking lot of his work. Jennifer had saved $1,500 from her piano lessons. She gave it to Ricardo and said she would contact him to make a date. According to Jennifer's story, Ricardo stopped answering her calls and disappeared with the money. Ricardo's version is that in July 2010, Jennifer phoned and asked to meet him for a coffee. She was in a hysterical state asking him to murder her parents. His answer was no way. He said that after this he stopped speaking to her. Ricardo was the black male that Jennifer's uncle had seen her with at the coffee shop. He admitted that she did give him money once, but that it was only $200 for a night out, which he paid back. Jennifer then went to her ex, Daniel Wong. Jennifer was the one in the household who always helped her mother with the bills. She knew the extent of their finances. If her parents died, she would be set to inherit half a million dollars. Her and Daniel could set up a house together and live a normal life. Daniel knew someone. Being in the drug trade, it was easy to find someone willing to do anything for money. This was when Daniel introduced Jennifer to Lenford Crawford, who they called Homeboy. Daniel gave Jennifer a spare iPhone so they could contact each other without anyone knowing. Jennifer used this phone to call Daniel and Crawford, or Homeboy, sometimes removing the SIM card, swapping it back and forth into her own phone. So with Crawford in charge and Daniel as an accomplice, Crawford recruited two other friends, David Milvaganum and Eric Carty who would be in charge of arranging the car and driving the three men to and from the scene. The fee was $5,000 for each parent, a total of $10,000. A small down payment was given by Jennifer. $2,000 was to be handed over during the home invasion, and the remaining money was to be handed over when life insurance payments came through. The date was set for November 2nd, but in the morning Jennifer received a text from Daniel. Daniel was honest with Jennifer. He had moved on with someone else. He told her that he felt for his new girlfriend the way Jennifer felt for him. Jennifer, so you feel for her what I feel for you, then call it off with homeboy. Daniel, I thought you wanted this for you. Jennifer, I do, but I have nowhere to go. Daniel, call it off with homeboy, question mark. You said you wanted this with or without me. Jennifer, I want it for me. Jennifer then received a text from Crawford. I need the time of completion. Think about it. Jennifer replied, Today is a no-go. Dinner plans out, so won't be home in time. Cardi was pleased the killing had been postponed, as he was having trouble getting enough money together for gas. The next day, Daniel texts Jennifer again. I did everything and lined it all up for you. Even though Daniel had pushed Jennifer away again, he continued to flirt with her and encouraged her to flirt back. On the morning of November 8th, 2010, Jennifer received another text from Crawford. After work, okay, will be game time. Between 4.30pm and 10.25pm, Jennifer and her old school friend Andrew exchanged nearly 100 text messages. They also spoke on the phone. Andrew wasn't involved in the plan, but she did tell him it was about to happen. He brushed it off. Even though only months prior, he had introduced her to Ricardo, someone he thought could help her kill her father. He would go on to testify that he didn't really believe she had gone ahead with it. Andrew had a crush on Jennifer. He said he had blinkers on. The extent of their texts are unknown, as Jennifer deleted them before the home invasion. At 6.12pm, Lenford Crawford called Jennifer. It was on. 
After Jennifer watched TV with her friend Adrian and he left, her and Daniel had a long text message conversation discussing in-jokes about chickens and monkeys. At 9pm, Eric Cardi and David Milvaganum met up in a hire car and collected Lenford Crawford. At 9.35pm, David Milvaganum's phone was used to call Jennifer. He let her know they were close. After Jennifer hung up, she opened the door of her bedroom and walked down the stairs. She said goodnight to her mother, walked to the front door and unlocked it. It was 9.45pm. At two minutes past ten, Jennifer walked to the dark study next to her parents' bedroom where her father was asleep. She flicked the study light on for a minute, then switched it off. Something which was caught on the security video footage from the house across the road. Two minutes later, David Milvaganum called again. This time they spoke for three and a half minutes. Within seconds of hanging up, the rental car pulled up at the house and Lenford Crawford, David Milvaganum and Eric Cardi walked through the front door, all three carrying guns. The evidence the police had against Jennifer was compelling. The messages and calls made from her everyday phone, as well as her burner phone, led them to piece together a clear picture of the planning that went into the staged home invasion. They needed to push her just that little bit further to confess. But she didn't. Instead of confessing, she spent further hours in the interview spinning a story of how she had arranged the home invasion, but the plan was to kill her, not her parents. She didn't want to bring shame on her family by committing suicide, so she created an elaborate suicide plan for a home invasion gone wrong. She said she tried to call off the hit, but somehow the wires got crossed and the men arrived and killed her mother and almost killed her father. Jennifer never left her third interview on November 22nd. York Regional Police arrested Jennifer and charged her with first-degree murder, attempted murder, and conspiracy to commit murder. Jennifer hunched over and sobbing, asked repeatedly, What happens to me? The day after Jennifer's arrest, police held a second press conference. Citing a continuing investigation, police provided few details about the arrest of Jennifer or the potential motive, but confirmed the investigation moved in a new direction when Han woke up from his coma and provided a version of events that differed greatly to Jennifer's. Detective Cook from the investigation team later said he knew something was up from the very beginning. He was an officer who continually voiced his opinion throughout the investigation. He said, I knew it was an inside job. I always thought she was part of it. You don't break into a house, shoot and kill two people, and then leave a witness tied up. I mean, they tied her up. It's not like she hid from them. She's tied up but other people are subject to being shot, yet not this person. Why not? It goes against everything we know. It just doesn't make sense. Jennifer was remanded into custody due to face court a week later. By now, the police were tracking their other suspects and got an interesting lead in the hours following Jennifer's arrest. After news broke of Jennifer being in custody, Cardi called Crawford while he was at work. When Crawford finished work, he headed towards Daniel Wong's house where he arrived at 2am. His and Daniel's phones pinged to the same cell phone tower for 40 minutes, leading police to believe they were in the same location engaging in a conversation. The same thing happened 12 hours later, just after 2pm. Daniel and Crawford were in the same location again. Crawford wasn't happy. If Jennifer had been arrested, who would be paying them? It took York Regional Police five months to make all the arrests. They relied on cell phone location analysis, cell phone calls and texts to piece the elaborate murder plan together. Along with Jennifer, all were charged with first degree murder, attempted murder and conspiracy to commit murder. The first two arrests police made were David Milvaganum and Eric Cardi. Cardi had since been arrested for another murder that occurred in 2009 and was already being held in a correctional facility at the time of his arrest. Detective Sergeant Larry Wilson released a statement. We are continuing to investigate this incident and are expecting further arrests. He refused to comment on the relationship between Jennifer and the two men accused, other than to acknowledge there was a connection. I'm not going to get into details in regards to motive, but I think with the daughter involved and the conspiracy aspect to it, I think the motive's pretty clear. He went on with a message for those not yet caught. I urge the remaining persons involved in this horrendous crime to seek legal counsel and turn themselves in immediately. 
York Regional Police Superintendent Wayne Kalinsky also released a statement. This was not a random act. Citizens will be relieved by the fact that we've made arrests in this matter. This was a targeted residence. On April 26, 2011, Daniel Wong was arrested in front of his colleagues at Boston Pizza. Two weeks later, Lenford Crawford was arrested at his girlfriend's house. With five people charged and awaiting trial, the prosecution got to work on their case. Police were commended for their diligent work in following the trail to catch those arrested. There were still thoughts that other people could possibly be linked on the peripheral, and it was still unclear who exactly pulled the trigger, but it was agreed the case would proceed with all five charged with first-degree murder, attempted murder, and conspiracy to commit murder. The detailed analysis of phone records was described as second to none, with over a million pieces of mobile phone data scanned in order to make the arrests. The case took three years to come to trial, and when the court sat on March 19, 2014, in the Newmarket Courthouse, it was expected to last five months. It would go on to last ten. The press was in overdrive. At the time of the home invasion, this case had taken over the news and was one of the biggest and most intriguing stories. After arrests were made, the story faded, and it was only now gearing back up for almost another year of intrigue as the fate of Jennifer Pan and her co-accused were in the hands of the court. Headlines like, Daughter from Hell Trial Begins, gives a little insight into the sentiment at the time. Reporters descended from all over Canada, the United States, China, the Philippines, and Vietnam. This story transcended through generations of Asian immigrant families to Canada. Hard-working parents and grandparents felt deep sorrow for Han Pan, who had only wanted what was best for his daughter. Other children of pushy, tiger parents as they were called, felt for Jennifer. A daughter pushed and pushed with expectations she could never reach, tipped over the edge. Jennifer, now 27, had aged in her three years in custody, her face no longer sweet and childlike. She'd had three years to reflect on the decisions she had made in her life that led her to that point. Three years without the love and support of her family, as they had cut off all ties with her following her arrest. All five accused were tried together. All of them pleaded not guilty. Judge Kerry Boswell told the jury that just because all five accused were being tried together, it didn't mean they should all get the same verdict. As the packed courtroom held their breath, the five accused shuffled in, their ankles shackled and their hands cuffed. They were led into their individual box seats separated by glass dividing walls, their shackles and cuffs removed before the jury arrived so as not to create bias against them. More than 50 witnesses testified and the jury saw over 200 exhibits, including long segments of the 10 hours of police interviews the police had with Jennifer. They saw hundreds of pages of cell phone records, including phone calls, text messages and location data. Given the nature of much of the language used in the text message conversations, an expert in urban street slang took the witness stand. But the key witness was Jennifer's father, Han, who addressed the jury with a sad tale of how he and his deceased wife had only wanted the best for their daughter. Crown lawyer Jennifer Harlejean presented a well-thought-out murder plan concocted by an intelligent and calculated daughter who couldn't get her own way, saying, Jennifer was determined to get her way, no matter what, even if it destroyed her family. Referring to the co-accused, their motive was money, and while they didn't all pull the trigger, each participated in carrying out Jennifer Pan's plan to murder her parents. The theory was that Jennifer orchestrated a staged home invasion in which both her parents would be killed and she'd get half, shared with her brother, of a handsome insurance inheritance, at least half a million dollars each, which she hoped would draw Daniel Wong, whom she was obsessed with, back into her life. It was about the money, and it was about Jennifer's loathing of her father. In order for the jury to have an understanding of Jennifer's motive, prosecutors took them back to the beginning of her story. They argued that Jennifer Pan's parents only wanted the best for their children, to work hard, get a university education, and have a better life than they did. Jennifer couldn't handle those high expectations. They took the jury through the lies and deceit that began in her early adolescence and continued to that day, sitting in court, still telling a tale so tightly woven that she could no longer see where one lie ended and another began. The prosecution alleged that after she was turned down by Ricardo Duncan, the first time she tried to have her father killed, she hatched a more elaborate and more violent plan, turning to her high school sweetheart, Daniel Wong, for help. 
Her plan was calculated and considered, and planned and deliberate. Jennifer was on the stand for seven days. She resembled the same character seen in her police interviews, softly spoken, bordering on shy, often with her head down. When not on the stand, she sat most of the time with her head low, sometimes covering her face with her hands, as she had done in her police interviews. She weaved her way around the damning text messages with her co-accused and desperately tried to convince the jury that although she had ordered a hit on her father in August 2010, three months later she had changed her mind. The court heard that Jennifer only wanted herself killed and ordered the hit to not bring the shame of suicide on her family. She said she never wanted her parents to be the target. It was her that was supposed to die. Jennifer's defence lawyer, Paul Cooper, painted Eric Cardi as a psychopathic killer who was not happy when Jennifer caught off her assisted suicide and not happy he hadn't been paid the $8,500 cancellation fee. Cooper stated, The events of that night were never supposed to happen. Jennifer would never be part of any plan to hurt her mother and she wasn't part of a plan to hurt her father. If this was a planned murder, why carry out the charade of the robbery? Why didn't the intruders shoot Mr and Mrs Pan immediately? He called it a sloppy robbery led by idiots in a hurry and said Eric Cardi was the one calling the shots. Cooper alleged that it was Cardi who started shooting because he was angry he wasn't receiving the money he wanted. Although sitting accused in this trial, Eric Cardi was now serving life in prison for the murder in 2009, a murder he was wanted for at the time of the Pan home invasion. It was an easy job to paint him as a killer with nothing to lose. He was present at the beginning of the trial but five months in, his lawyer became sick and was unable to continue with his defence, which led to Cardi's exit from the trial. He was tried separately at a later date. Cooper admitted to the jury that Jennifer had a history of lying, but claimed her web of deceit only showed her to be a sheltered young woman with the social skills of a teenager. He said they could not convict her of murder and reminded them they had to believe beyond a reasonable doubt that she meant for her parents to die. With Cardi now out of this trial, the defence for Crawford, Milvaganum and Daniel Wong told the court there was little evidence to convict the three men, other than the phone records. No DNA evidence was presented at trial. There was no forensic evidence gathered from the house, no bloody clothes found, and no weapons recovered. The defence argued that if it was such a sloppy job, as alleged by Jennifer's defence, then where was the physical evidence? Daniel Wong's defence lawyer said, are you going to convict my client of a cold-blooded murder based on a couple of text messages? Are you kidding me? He described Daniel as a university-educated, hard-working man who played the trumpet, who somehow got mixed up with dealing marijuana, and who fell under the spell of Jennifer Pan. She's a pathological liar who was playing games in the sickest possible way with Daniel's head, he said. Five months into the trial, it was revealed that juror number four's wife had sat in the courtroom every day watching. When Jennifer's father took the witness stand, he was joined by two Vietnamese interpreters. He did not look over at his daughter. He said the crime had shattered his life, adding that he was astonished he survived the shots through his face and shoulder. He spoke with a deep sadness as he told the court of the decade of lying he and his wife endured from Jennifer. The jury took four days to reach its verdict. On December 13, 2014, at 1.20pm, the jury informed Justice Boswell that a verdict had been reached. The accused all stood in the prisoner's dock while their verdicts were read one by one. Jennifer Pan, David Milvaganum, Daniel Wong and Lenford Crawford were all found guilty of the murder of Bikar Pan and the attempted murder of Han Pan. Jennifer, as she always did, hung her head low and sobbed. This time only she knew if the tears were real. She could be heard saying, They didn't even give me a chance. One by one, each was asked to sit down. Family members were crying and some screaming as they left the courtroom. Han chose not to deliver his victim impact statement in person. A witness protection aide read it out. It read, When I lost my wife, I lost my daughter at the same time. I don't feel like I have a family anymore. On the day Big Har died, I feel like I died too. My life totally changed that day. Some say I should feel lucky to be alive but I feel like I am dead too. I can't work anymore because of my injuries and I've given up on all the things I used to do, like gardening, working on cars and listening to music. There is no joy in any of that for me. 
I miss my wife so much. She knew me better than anyone and cared about me. I am so lonely without her. We were married for almost 30 years. Bikar was a good wife and a good mother. She always put her children first and rarely spent money on herself. She loved music and loved to go line dancing. She took care of our children while I worked. She had always wanted to go to Vietnam, and I always said we have to spend our money on the children's education first, but once they have finished school, we can focus on doing the things we want then. But that time never came for her. I don't find any joy in holidays anymore. I am sad and lonely all the time. Sometimes when I see my friends, I try to pretend I am happy, but struggle with being jealous of my friends' families and their happiness. My only hope for the future is that Felix will get married and let me live with him. Right now, I live with my two sisters and my elderly mother as I can't stand being in my home because of all the bad memories of what happened there. There are repairs that need to be done on the house, but because of my injuries, I am unable to do anything. I don't like going to my house because my neighbours ask me what happened and I am ashamed. I can't sell the house because it is in a Chinese neighbourhood with superstition and no one would want to live there because of the murder. I cannot sleep at night and have constant nightmares about what happened the night we were shot. I feel panicked all the time, especially when I see a group of young men in the street. I am not racist at all, but black men really scare me if I see them standing in a group. I am in a lot of pain and take medication for pain every day. I have no appetite as food is not pleasurable to me because I know I would never be able to taste my wife's cooking again. I am also on medication for diabetes and high cholesterol as I cannot exercise as it is too painful. My life has totally changed. I attend my wife's grave with my brother and sister-in-law on the anniversary of her death and on other special holidays and it is so very hard on me to remember how she died and what my life has become. I am a very lonely person and have no one to share my feelings with as my son Felix does not want to talk about what happened and just wants to forget. It is very hard for Felix. He doesn't want to hear his sister's name and doesn't want to know about what happens in court. Felix has become very separate and is a very different person. He doesn't want to talk about the family and he is very closed down, distant and too sad. He says he doesn't want to remember and won't look for a job in Toronto because he feels like he has a bad family name because everyone knows about his mother's murder. I hope my daughter Jennifer thinks about what has happened to her family and can become a good and honest person someday. Justice Boswell described the crime as horrific. He said, The circumstances faced by Jennifer's father Ham and mother Bikar were that of stark horror. Those willing to go along with such a plan have very little concern for human life. These were crimes of terrifying violence. All accused were sentenced to life without parole for 25 years for the first degree murder of Bikar Pan and to life for the attempted murder of Han Pan. The sentences would run concurrently. The earliest Jennifer Pan will be able to apply for parole is 2035. She will be 48 years old. The judge ended with, She lived a life of deception and they did not deserve the death penalty she imposed on them. This was a business transaction. The commodity. Death. Eric Cardi wasn't retried. Cardi said he wanted to put an end to hand suffering by pleading out to avoid another lengthy trial. He admitted he conspired with the other accused to have Han and Bikar killed for $10,000. He was sentenced to 18 years in prison, to be served concurrently with a 25-year sentence he was already serving for the unrelated murder. It is still unknown who pulled the trigger. The case was summed up in the Toronto Star by journalist Rosie D'Amano, who said, All this horror, a mother shot in the head, her final words a plea that her daughter be spared. A father shot through the eye who miraculously survived his grievous wounds for the obsessive love of a man who did not love her back. <laughs>